and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to listen to The Resilient Bride, which is another billionaire marriage brokers video. And I know for those of you who are following along that it's been a couple weeks since I have uploaded a billionaire marriage brokers story, but The Resilient Bride is a little bit different and it does come with a content warning that one of the characters um, has cancer and is terminal. So when I was writing this series, I had a reader come in and say, what would happen if one or both of the main characters, the bride and the groom, what if one of them was sick? And honestly, I thought Nicholas Sparks should write that story. That is not my story. <laughs> I needed to come up with um, a happy ever after in this story. That What I hope comes across is the feeling that, um, that it's okay. So this story actually came from a time in my life when I had lost four grandparents within the matter of 12 months. So um, my grandpa on my mom's side, my grandma on my dad's side, and my husband's father's mother and father. So grandma and grandpa that were married. Um, and they all passed away within 12 months. And so this was the first set of passings that I had dealt with since my great grandmother passed when I was 18 years old. And I was just kind of thrown into this tidal wave of grief to have lost so many so quickly. This story is kind of a product of the peace that I eventually gained while I was in that space of my life. Again, it comes with a content warning. There's cancer, there's death, there's those things. Um, but there is also a happy ending. But have I talked you out of listening to this book yet? <laughs> Maybe after all my warnings, you can understand why I was a little hesitant to put it right up with the other billionaire marriage brokers books, but it's going to be out there and you're going to have it. And if you're catching up with us six months down the road or whatever, they're all going to be there anyway. So here we go. Can I just say that I really do love this story. It is a beautiful though somewhat tragic story. And I hope you love it too. And if you have comments for me, leave them in the comment section. If you want to share your story about surviving cancer or about a loved one who passed, I would love to have those in the comments. So feel free to share. And anyway, I will see you on the other side. The Resilient Bride, a billionaire marriage broker's romance novel written by Lucy McConnell. Read by Christina Dimmick. Chapter 1 Liam Bernhard took a large bite of bean and stick and savored the vanilla flavor as the sweet pastry melted into his taste buds. There's enough cream in this to choke a cow. You keep eating like this, and you will be a cow, countered his older brother, David. Liam pointed at David's plate covered with large swetchen kutchen. You're older than me. Your metabolism is slower. David grunted. I work out. Liam grunted back. Life's too short to live in a gym. The Zwetschgen Kutchen went to the table and stayed on the square napkin like a forlorn and forgotten friend. Liam didn't mean to bring up his impending doom, but he just couldn't see the point of ignoring it like David wanted to. David, Liam's best friend and partner in crime, had been in a perpetual bad mood, and Liam was tired of living with Eeyore. The last six months of revelry and dream-making darkened like the German sky above them. They'd skied, golfed, surfed, swum, biked, viewed priceless artwork, toured ancient ruins, dug for buried treasure, and even sailed the high seas. His more recent exploits had taken a domestic turn, and they'd sampled foods across the globe. Even now they occupied two chairs in a small German bakery with a full selection of the baker's wares spread before them. What did Liam care if he took one bite of everything? I've been thinking. Liam trailed off, taking another large bite and chomping away like a kid at scout camp. Yes? David folded his arms. What this adventure needs is a woman's touch. Liam had David's full attention. I'd like a warm body around once in a while. David lifted an eyebrow. 
Exactly what do you have in mind? Liam reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a business card he'd gotten from his trust fund manager. BMB? David raised an eyebrow. Billionaire marriage brokers. You're out of your mind. A side effect from the tumor, I'm sure. David glared at the table. You're buying a wife? Isn't that human trafficking? Hire. I would hire a wife uniquely chosen for me. Uniquely chosen by whom? Liam picked up a crepple. It looked like a donut. Pamela Jones. David licked icing off his thumb. Is this prostitution? Do I need to call mom? Ha! <laughs> no. There's no hanky-panky. It's in the contract. Besides the fact that the drugs I'm on make that impossible. For that reason alone, he'd been happy to sign up for a business marriage, any marriage. The fact that Pamela could find him a wife who could also be his nurse was a benefit. David was a great brother and buddy, and Ella was an excellent personal secretary, but neither of them knew the first thing about medicine. According to his doctor-issued timeline, Liam had three months left. That was great on paper, but he suspected the doctor had been overly optimistic. He couldn't explain his premonition, just that he knew if he was going to find a bride, now was the time. Liam wanted to be married before he died. He wanted to know what it was like to have someone to belong to, and if that meant going through billionaire marriage brokers, then that's what he would do. Chapter 2 Kira Martin gathered the IV tubing and empty fluid bags, throwing them into the appropriate containers on her way out of room 304. Ducking her head, she sidled past the bottleneck of family members who drew together in the hallway discussing treatment options for their loved one in room 302. She prayed she could escape for the day without running into Andrew, again. One of several nurses working in the Infusion and Advanced Therapeutics Center, Andrew had a reputation for coming on strong and then dropping out at the first I love you. Many of the single nurses, and a few of the married ones, had commented on his good looks. With his golden brown eyes, black hair, and semi-developed biceps, he probably was good-looking. Kira couldn't form an opinion. Her dating radar had been down since her horrible marriage to Jack Miller ended over two years ago. Andrew hadn't picked up on the idea that Kira wasn't emotionally available. He was. Persistent, which was why she was sneaking out at the end of her shift. The Huntsman Cancer Institute lobby was a study in circles. The staircase curved around the edge. Cream and gray tile spread across the floor, arranged like rings around the sun. Even the furniture was curved, denoting the eternal natures of hope, love, and faith. Taking the wide stairs at a light jog, her hand gracing the mahogany banister, Kira checked over her shoulder several times to make sure the coast was clear. She hit the floor with a jolt of accomplishment and aimed her gaze towards the steel and glass revolving door. Like the wheels of fate, the door turned once and deposited the last person Kira had ever expected to see at the cancer center. Her ultra-padded white Nikes skidded to a stop, the squeak too loud for the formal lobby. Pamela Jones Perfect Pamela, as Kira had dubbed her, hadn't aged a day in the past two years, while Kira felt as though she'd aged twenty. Pamela ran a matchmaking company for the ultra-wealthy, matching brides and grooms' skills together to create short-term business marriages. Pamela was the one who had arranged Kira's marriage to Jack the Jerk. They made eye contact, and Pamela's baby blues sparkled with possibilities. Kira gripped her giraffe print faux leather bag like a quarterback ready to break through the defensive line. She wanted nothing to do with that sparkle, but when Pamela Jones wanted to talk, Kira found that listening proved beneficial. With a sigh of resignation, she put on her best social butterfly face and marched forward. Pamela smiled. Hello, Kira. You're looking lovely. Kira loosened her grip on her purse. She'd just finished a 10-hour shift. 
Her ebony hair hugged her scalp in a tight bun at the base of her neck, her scrubs hung loose on her frame, and she hadn't bothered with makeup that morning. Undeserving of the compliment, Kira nevertheless accepted it. Thank you. Pamela Jones had a near-perfect record. Kira had taken the record from perfect and made it nearly perfect in one disastrous marriage. However, Kira couldn't lay all the blame at Pamela's feet. Jack was an expert at wearing two faces, one in public and one in private. You're looking wonderful yourself. Hooking her arm through Kira's, Pamela steered them towards the sorrel leather couches. Are you here for an appointment? Kira hoped not. Though she couldn't fathom what would be so important as to drag the California mogul to the crossroads of the West. Pamela laughed, the sound tinkling through the air. No. I came to speak to you. Drat. She silently cursed. Oh. Shall we? Pamela indicated a sofa. Kira sat with her purse on her knees and her bottom on the edge of the cushion. How's your mom? Pamela asked. Kira turned to watch pedestrians pass by on the other side of the large window. Most of them were buried in their phones. She's in remission. They do scans every three months. Expensive scans, she added in her head. I'm so glad to hear that. Kira straightened up. Thank you for the flowers. That was very kind of you. A large bouquet of flowers had arrived after every one of Mom's chemo sessions, along with a card emblazoned with the billionaire marriage broker's logo and a handwritten note from Pamela. Caught up in medical bills, prescriptions, housework, and just surviving for a time, she'd forgotten her manners. I meant to send you a thank you, but... Pamela waved her hand. Your mother sent a card. Kira made a face. Of course she did. Even facing death, mom clings to propriety. Pamela tipped her head. Do you like working here? Slouching, Kira contemplated her answer. It's a good job. A bit hard on the heartstrings, though. How did a person explain the struggle of working with people who face death on a daily basis? Of coming to care for a patient, watching them love deep, cry hard, and fight like the Dickens to live while writing in journals and making videos for their children in case they didn't? It was awful and yet noble at the same time. Some days Kira dreaded getting out of bed, knowing she would face the Grim Reaper the moment she walked through the door. On those days, she focused on her mom, a cancer survivor, and knew that someone needed to take up the gauntlet. As if her indecision, questions, and concerns were written on her face, Pamela said, perhaps this is not the path you were meant to take. Intrigued, Kira ran her hands along her legs. I haven't seen another path. This is what I've studied for, dedicated my life to. Darling, there's always another path. Well, I suppose I could check into private nursing companies. They pay better. A smile tugged at Pamela's cheeks. You're almost there. Almost where? I have a client. Kira shot to her feet. Uh, nope. She shoved her purse into the crook of her arm. I'm not doing that again. Pamela stood. Kiara. Her voice was like a thunderclap, slapping Kiara's fears aside and focusing her attention. Please, listen. It has to be you. Shaking her head, Kiara backed away, fighting Pamela's supernatural pull. I can't do it. I can't set myself up for another emotional beating. Please understand Pamela. She turned, barely catching Pamela's, I do, before busting out the doors and escaping the possibility of getting married again. Is that you, baby girl? Yes, mom, Kiera answered as she shucked her shoes by the front door. 
Their two-bedroom condo had beige carpets and beige walls throughout, with beige countertops in the tiny kitchen and one bathroom. Far enough away from downtown Salt Lake City, Utah, to make rent affordable, it was also close enough to take the light rail system and save gas money, which was a major plus, considering the medical bills looming over them like the Wasatch Mountains. Look what I found today. Kiera's mother, Amelia, waved her arms over a sad-looking nightstand like one of Bob Barker's beauties on the old Price is Right show. With one cubbyhole, curvy legs, water spots, and horrible green paint, the piece was in bad shape, nicked worse than a table at Chuck E. Cheese's. Kiera frowned. The nightstand reminded her of her mom. Kimo had done a number on Amelia Martin. It stole her curves, dulled her complexion, and zapped her energy. Even now, Amelia struggled to be active for a full eight hours in the day, which made holding a regular job impossible. She'd taken to rescuing furniture from yard sales and Deseret Industries, refurbishing them, and selling them on KSL.com. It didn't pay much, but she pushed herself to exhaustion each day with her efforts. You don't like it? Amelia's hands went to her bony hips. Kira kissed her cheek as she passed. I don't see what you see, but if anyone can make it beautiful, it's you. Thank you. Amelia punctuated her words with a nod and a quick brush of her hands over the avocado green undertaking. Entering the kitchen, Kira took out a container of orange juice concentrate from the freezer and found the large pitcher. She set both on the table, her eyes straying to the mail in the center. On top of the small pile was a blue envelope. Her fingers trembled, and Kira gulped. Blue envelopes were bad. Blue meant collections. Whoever had sent the letter was mistaken. She'd been meticulous about making payments, stretching her paycheck like a cheap hair elastic. Opening the letter, she scanned once before returning to the top to read for details. Sure enough, she was being sent to collections. Double-checking the letterhead, she searched her memory for this particular medical lab and couldn't remember them. Opening the cupboard above the phone, she pulled out her financial notebook and compared the information to her list of debtors. You're going to put rings all over that table. Amelia picked the dripping orange juice container up with two fingers and carried it to the sink. Sorry, Kira mumbled. Sweetie, you're mumbling again. Sorry. Kira reached for the phone. I've got to call this company. What company is that? Select Farm Testing. They say I owe them $5,000. It's got to be a scam. I'm going to report them. The container slipped from Amelia's hand and clanged into the sink. Don't. Startled, Kira looked up from the letter. Why not? Amelia dropped her head into her hands. It's not a scam. It has to be. They're threatening to sue me. I'm so sorry baby girl. I thought I could, you know, that I could pay at least one of the medical bills with my business. I picked a small one, hoping you wouldn't notice. But I missed a few months when I was sick last winter, and then the interest piled on and they wanted late fees and I can't keep up. Kira's stomach dropped. This is legit? Amelia nodded. Mom. As if the debt and impending lawsuit wasn't bad enough. The possibility existed that their landlord would find out and evict them. The guy was a stickler for on-time payments because he advertised a no-credit-check, move-in policy, no check to move in, but credit checks followed if you were an hour late on the rent. This was bad. Were you going to tell me before some guy showed up at the door demanding payment? You've already done so much and used all your bride money to pay for treatments. I just kept putting it off. You have a difficult job, and I didn't want to stress you out. That backfired she gripped silently. Even if by some miracle she got a raise, she wouldn't be able to pay this debt. Collections companies don't mess around. 
they'd garnish her paycheck and leave her with nothing to live off of. Amelia put her arm around Kira. What can I do? Nothing. But Kira couldn't say that out loud. I guess you'd better get started on that nightstand. Amelia bit her lip. Not one to throw in the towel, Kira knew what she had to do. Becoming a BMB bride had been a huge mistake the first time, but it paid enough to cover her mom's diagnosis and the first round of chemo with cash. Saying I do would give her the chance to say paid in full on almost all their debt. The weight of debt had pulled her down and worn her out. She was so tired of all this, and her plan to pay off everything was a 15-year commitment. BMB marriages were for 12 months, maybe 18. She could live through anything or live with anyone for that long if it would pull her and her mom out of this financial hole. Kira wouldn't put up with another Jack the Jerk. At the first sign of verbal abuse, she would bail. Just like last time, she'd get a large settlement, and they'd be fine. She'd be fine. Everything would be fine if she could stop the icy fear creeping just under her skin. Don't worry. I got a job offer today that will take care of this. She waved the letter. And it comes with a nice advance. Why didn't you tell me? Amelia threw her arms around Kira and hugged her close. I meant to. Kira grinned. But you had that nightstand, and I just kept putting it off. Oh, you. Amelia swatted Kira's arm. I've got to make a call. Kira fished her cell phone out of her pocket and headed to the front door to get some privacy. I'll have the orange juice ready for you, Mom called. Thanks. Once outside, Kira took a deep breath and scrolled through her contacts. She hadn't called BMB in years. Thankfully, she'd held on to the company-provided phone from her first marriage. It wasn't the latest model, but it did all the important things, like retain BMB's number, complete with California area code. BMB, this is Tina. How may I help you? Tina? Kira gripped the phone, her hand slippery. This is Kira Martin. How are you doing? Oh my gosh. I'm great. How are you? Fine. Um. Words became sticky. I think Pamela, I mean, I saw Pamela today. Oh. I, can I leave her a message? Sure. Okay. Um. Will you tell her I changed my mind? Tina's pause indicated that she didn't know if Kira's cryptic statement indicated good or bad things on the horizon. And if it all works out, I'll be seeing you real soon. Wonderful. Tina was the type of person who smiled at birds and chipmunks and kittens and pit bulls, and they smiled back. Memories of Tina's warm welcomes, Harrison's big brother teasing, and Trisha's shopping sprees danced inside Kira's mind. BMB wasn't bad. Jack was bad, Jack was horrendous. But pre-wedding preparation had been an exciting time. Which would explain why Kira was optimistic about setting foot in the BMB offices once again. Chapter 3 This is the stupidest thing you've ever done. Liam leaned back in his seat in the BMB waiting room and gave David a disbelieving grin. Really? The stupidest thing. I can name at least five things off the top of my head that are dumber than getting married. David put his elbows on his knees and leaned forward. I'm calling your bluff. Liam checked them off on his fingers. Eating a whole bag of tacos in 20 minutes. Adopting a snake. Liam shuddered. He hated snakes. Dressing up as a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader for Halloween. That one got a smile out of David. Punching Michael Robertson in ninth grade for kissing Jasmine. And dying. Though he'd meant the last one as a joke, David's half-smile turned into a negative three smile, which wasn't a smile at all. 
which made Liam ache for his brother. It was bad enough to have an expiration date, but to have to watch the guy who had been there for him his whole life suffer because of it. Sucked. I win on a technicality. You haven't done number five. I guess you're right. Getting married is in the top five dumbest things I've done. Liam lifted his shoulder. But I'm doing it anyway. Tina, the receptionist, delivered the sodas she'd promised. Kira should be done with the prenup any minute now, and then I'll show you back to Pamela's office for the ceremony. Is that all right? Thanks, that will be great, Liam answered. Do I look groomy? He straightened his bow tie and tugged on the lapels of his brand new, custom-made tuxedo. I'm still not sure why you bought that thing. David pulled at his shirt collar. Or made me wear this one. Liam laughed. If I'm going to wear something for eternity, I want it to look good. That's your burial suit? David's mouth hung open. You are twisted. Perhaps. Trish smiled. Dashing, I'd say. She settled behind her desk. Someone appreciates my sense of style. Liam jerked his chin towards the cute redhead. Speaking softer, he egged David on, dare you to ask her out. David rolled his eyes and popped the top to his drink. Not my type. Thanks, Harrison. Liam's attention was drawn to the silky voice. A raven-haired beauty in a bright orangey-pink form-fitting dress smiled hesitantly as her eyes danced across him and landed on David, who dropped his soda. Dude! Liam scrambled away from the fizzy fountain spraying liquid through the air. Sorry. David rushed to pick up his drink. It slipped. No harm, assured Trish. She picked up the phone. Hi. Can we get a mop? Thank you. She set the phone down. Should be cleaned up in no time. David shook his sopping fingers. I'll just go wash up. He ducked into the hallway and disappeared. The woman stepped aside as he passed, her cheeks flushed. Harrison stepped forward. He was a decent guy, the type you called for a game of pickup ball. With salt in his peppered sideburns and smile lines framing his mouth, Liam guessed the BMB lawyer had already outlived him. Kira Martin, I'd like to introduce you to Liam Bernhard. You're Liam? She looked over her shoulder in the direction David had gone, recovered quickly, and offered her hand. It's nice to meet you. I hear we're getting married. Her smile was hesitant and her cheeks were smooth, like silk that was meant to be handled with care. Shaking off his intimate thoughts, Liam replied, that's the rumor. He took her slender hand, and something shifted inside of him. Like his soul was a Chinese puzzle box and Kira configured the sections in perfect alignment. Have we met before? He searched her electric blue eyes, seeing interest, understanding, and a reflection of his best self. This woman was his match, his mate, his everything. The knowledge burned in his chest like a forge stoked by Hephaestus. The understanding should have frightened him, it wasn't every day that a man has a revelation. Instead of causing internal chaos, the knowledge spread peace from the tips of his gelled blonde hair to the laces on his magnani shoes. Like warm butter over a sweet germ noddle, Kira would make his life delectable, and he was more than ready to start sampling married life. Kira didn't back down under his scrutiny. She'd leaned closer, taking him in. Her brow furrowed. I don't think so, but you seem familiar and safe. She drew her hand back, ducking her head. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to come out. Liam placed his hand on her elbow, wanting to wrap her up in his arms but worried that she might not have an understanding of his situation, that she'd not seen the possibilities between them. His diagnosis had forced him to take a different approach to life, to look beyond this earth, 
which had opened his mind to a sense of the spiritual that he'd never achieved sitting in Sunday school. Not that he had anything against Sunday school, he enjoyed Pastor Thompson's continued tutelage. His heart hadn't been open to the spirit until he'd turned down the everyday stress and struggles and began living as if he were dying. At first, he wanted to share these new discoveries with everyone he met, until they looked at him as if he were a bald cat with a skin condition. Since then, he'd kept those feelings closer to his heart, sacred even. Not knowing if Kira was receptive, he replied, no worries. I say all sorts of things that shouldn't come out. Life's too short to filter. Kira smiled shyly. You might be sorry you said that. The desk phone beeped, and Tina stood. If you're ready, we can move into Pamela's office. Liam gestured towards the hallway. I'm ready if you are. Kira's hands went to her stomach. She stared at the wall, a shadow of fear pricking at her pretty brow. I guess I am. Her eyes met his, and Liam poured all of his desires to protect her and care for her into his gaze. She soaked him in, drawing on his well of stability and confidence before nodding. Yes, I'm ready. Tina went first to show the way, taking Kira along with her. They chatted about Tina's hours and her new hair color. Harrison and Liam brought up the rear. If you ask me if I get highlights, I'm gonna deck you, Liam joked. Harrison chuckled. Don't let Trish hear you say that. He pointed to the open office door as they passed. You'll hurt her feelings. Trish? The resident makeover artist. Style consultant. Trish called from her zebra-striped sofa as they passed her office. Harrison stopped in the doorway, a cocky grin on his face. Looks like you missed out on this one. He jerked his head toward Liam, enjoying this opportunity to tease his co-worker. Liam caught the interest in the tilt of Harrison's head. Co-worker and girlfriend perhaps? Trish eyed Liam up and down, twice. Her assessing gaze reminded him of defending his dissertation. He doesn't need my help. The jacket is perfectly tailored, the pants are cut just right, and his tie. Impeccable. I couldn't have picked a better shoe. She put her hand over her heart and melted into her seat. He's flawless. Harrison's face darkened. You don't have to rub it in. He pushed away from the door. Not girlfriend, yet. Liam shot a wink at Trish. Thanks. She winked back. I spent yesterday with Kira and your credit card. Thank you. Liam shook his head. Harrison had his hands full with that one. David popped out of the men's room. He gripped Liam's shoulder and spoke low. I take everything back. She's the best decision you ever made. His appreciative gaze locked on Kira's back as she disappeared into Pamela's office. You always were a sucker for long hair. Liam clapped him on the back. Come on. I'm getting married. Chapter 4 Kira had been nervous at her first wedding. Her blood pumped like carbonated water through her system. She'd fretted over her dress, her wardrobe, and her hair like a prom queen, believing that it had all been worth it when Jack slipped that ring on her finger. Jack was a plastic surgeon, he said he made his living pointing out women's flaws. That should have been a red flag. Instead, in naivety she'd giggled at his wit. Several months later, after Jack had picked apart everything from the shape of her feet to the slight upturn of her nose in such detail, that she couldn't look in a mirror without seeing what he saw, she'd confided her situation to Trish. Amidst the tears and tissues, Kira admitted defeat and ended the marriage with the full force of BMB backing her. Pamela's support, Harrison's legal knowledge, and Trisha's daily phone calls shielded her from Jack and his scalpel tongue as she patched herself up as best she could. During yesterday's shopping spree with Trish, 
Kira had picked out the most beautiful salmon dress that hugged her hips and flared at the knees. The color was a pleasant contrast to her dark hair and made her blue eyes pop. Her eyes weren't the only thing popping. Kira found herself once again bubbling and fizzing as she signed the prenup. This time around, she wasn't dazzled by the money, she zeroed in on the groom, peppering Harrison with questions about Liam's past, his work, and his family. Harrison didn't reveal much, except that he liked Liam. The endorsement did little to ease her apprehension. She'd marched forward, knowing that this marriage was the means to an end, the end of her life of servitude to medical bills. The marriage train was gaining speed, and any moment now Kira was going to throw herself on the tracks. To break things up, she pulled Liam off to the side while the others made small talk. He should know what he was getting into. In the interest of full disclosure, I think you should know that I was married once before. Uh-oh. He didn't look like he wanted to bail, so she pressed on. Here. It, well, it didn't go well. She sucked air in through her teeth. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, this might not. Oh. She shook out her hands, the fizziness inside made them tingle. Liam took her by the shoulders and looked into her eyes. That calmness she'd seen in the lobby, the one that ran deeper than the ocean, flooded her once again. She soaked him in, and he gave and gave and gave. Kira, are you? Are you afraid of me? Not you personally. Kira stared at his bow tie, unwilling to drain him further. Marriage to any man, in general, terrifies me. His hands went up and down her arms bringing warmth back to her extremities. Then why are you doing this? It's a long story. She bit her lip, refusing to say more. She had a lot of baggage, financial and otherwise, that she preferred to keep zipped away and stashed in the attic of her subconscious. The debt could have been disclosed, but the prenuptial agreement specified that neither of them would assume the other's wealth or financial obligations. She preferred to keep that to herself, for now. Strange, Liam instilled a sense of trust that hadn't been earned. Scratch that, he'd been through things in his life, she could see them etched into the lines around his mouth, that had earned her respect. Perhaps one day he would share those with her. Giving herself a mental shake, she recounted the boundaries instilled in a professional marriage. I'm not sure what you need right now. Liam's hand stilled. I won't force you into this. The determination portrayed in the gentle but firm way he held her spoke directly to her anxiety, calming it like a lion tamer and sending it back to its cage. Grasping his forearms, she whispered, You don't have to force me. I just needed to be reminded that I have a choice. She'd been so wrapped up in her fears that she hadn't thought much about why Liam was doing this. What did he need at the moment? Why are you here? Using one hand, he moved her hair over her shoulder and smiled. Life's too short to spend it alone. Pausing, he brushed his fingers across her cheek in a way that was familiar, as if he'd done it a thousand times before. I need a companion, a friend. Can you do that? Can you stand by me even if it's hard? You're not going to jail, are you? Kira blurted. Liam tipped his head back and laughed, causing everyone in the room to turn their direction. He lifted his right arm in a scout salute. I promise I am not going to jail. Kira returned his smile. Okay, then. Okay? You'll marry me? Okay, I'll marry you. Okay. He hooked his arm around her shoulder and guided her to stand before the justice of the peace. His best man and one of their witnesses stood at his other side. Kira couldn't help but compare the two brothers. David was taller than Liam, and Liam was about four inches taller than her. They had the same Roman nose and nice, full lips. But where Liam was quick to smile and easy to be near, David was reserved and brooding. 
Liam had blonde hair with white ends that hinted at time spent in the sun, or a great salon. But no, Liam was much too guyish to hang out in a salon. He seemed like the type to get annoyed by pesky things such as haircuts. David wore his hair longer and had full sideburns. Liam had prominent bone structure, while David's face was healthy and strong with a firm, sharp jaw and alluring eyes the color of a storm cloud. Kira believed her experience with Jack had scared her smart. Where she had gone into that marriage charmed by his good looks and seduced by his money, this time, she'd garnered a promise for friendship. Which was the prudent thing to do. Or so she thought, right up until Liam slipped a huge diamond on her finger. A princess cut with sapphire teardrops on each side set in platinum nearly set her into a panic attack. Liam grasped her fingers, flooding her with peace. She met his aquamarine eyes, and just like when they'd first met, she felt safe, like he'd wrapped her in a warm blanket fresh from the dryer. He even smelled like laundry soap and something else, almost familiar with a husky quality. After they were pronounced legally and lawfully wed, Liam made his way around the room, accepting congratulations with a hearty handshake and a slap on the back. David moved in front of Kira, his hands stuffed into his pants' pockets. Welcome to the family, he said in such a low voice Kira had to lean closer to hear. David smelled like exotic locations where spices were sold in open-air markets. The night sky was unpolluted with artificial lights making stars the main attraction, and where men pledged their lives and undying love to mysterious beauties. Being near him made her want to sway her hips when she walked and wear skirts made from flowing material that brushed her ankles. Looking into David's aqua eyes was a totally unique and unsettling experience. His gaze held the power to strip away the armored layers around her heart and expose her very core. David was dangerous. Liam came back to her, dropping kisses on both cheeks and rocking her in his embrace. Kira couldn't help but catch his happy wave and ride along with him, a sense of deja vu washing over her. Her gaze darted to David with his edgy aura and back again. Kira was grateful she married the safe brother. After a quick photo session in front of the BMB logo, Kira, Liam, and David rode the elevator together. The small space filled with the tantalizing smell of designer cologne, crisp aftershave, and men. Working hard to ignore the ooey-gooey sensation in her lower belly, Kira studied the floor. The metal doors opened, and they stepped into the lobby. Where to? Kira had been picked up by a BMB town car for the ceremony. She'd been so consumed by the wedding that she hadn't given any thought to where they would go after. I feel like ice cream, no. Liam perked up. Gelato. Real gelato. What? Like now? Kira checked her upgraded BMB phone. It was 11, and with her nerves at DEFCON 5, eating was not a good idea. Maybe I could unpack and then we could eat. She indicated the two black suitcases waiting right where she'd left them at the security desk. No unpacking. We have a plane to catch. Liam went to pick up a suitcase. David was beside him in a flash, taking both of them as if they were loaves of bread. Kira hadn't packed light, and she was impressed with his strength. Liam looked up as if David exasperated him before taking off at a trot. Hurrying to keep up, Kira lengthened her stride. Did you say plain? Well, sure. How else are we supposed to get Italian gelato? Liam ducked into the back of a waiting limo. Kira stayed on the curb, staring after Liam and working to process his announcement. We're flying to Italy? Now? David cupped her elbow, sending a jolt of electricity dancing across her skin. Welcome to life with Liam. He looked to where his hand held her arm as if he were holding a Faberge egg, and he stepped away. He didn't look back as he climbed into the car. Liam poked his head out of the car. Come on, princess. You don't want to miss our honeymoon, do you? I.
Kira ran her hand through her hair. Liam may be kind, but what kind of a person flies to Italy for a gelato craving? I married a five-year-old, she muttered. Then again, if she had a billion dollars, what would she do? She'd spent so long focused on getting through the next month, making the next payment, keeping her nose to that grindstone, that she hadn't looked up to the future. Daydreaming had lost its allure. As she worked on her own to pay the debt, a life of servitude stretched ahead. Now, with a fresh bride deposit clearing her account, she was ahead of the creditors, and she felt good, free, lighter than she had in years. Her gaze went to the end of the street, and she took a cleansing breath. Climbing into the car, she settled in the seat next to Liam and across from David. Liam's eyes lit up. I knew you couldn't resist an adventure. I can resist adventure, she countered. It's gelato I can't pass up. Ha! <laughs> We're cut from the same cloth. He waved his hand back and forth between them. Heaven help me. David dropped his face into his hands. There are two of them. Chapter 5 Knowing the caliber of clients Pamela entertained, Kira wasn't at all shocked to find a private plane waiting for them at a small airport outside of L.A. The limo pulled right onto the tarmac, stopping a mere ten feet from the stairs. Her bags were whisked aboard by an attendant in black slacks and a forest green polo shirt. Several men and women in the same uniform swarmed the aircraft, and a large fuel truck was tucked under one wing. A tube, like an industrial umbilical cord, stretched up to the fuel dock. Two flight attendants in matching navy pencil skirts, crisp white blouses, and hot pink lipstick waited at the top of the stairs, their smiles bright, white, and professional. Liam climbed out behind her and leaned against the open door, a concerned twist to his brow. He'd been light-hearted and quick to smile during the drive and Kira had felt comfortable with his arm behind her. She nudged him with her elbow. Don't like flying? I'm fine, he snapped. Kira stepped back. I'm sorry. Liam took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. I have a headache. I didn't mean to snap at you. It's fine. Kira moved ahead to put some space between them. She'd been okay, with happy Liam, but she didn't like the mood swing. Perhaps he did just have a headache, but his behavior bore watching. Despite the calmness she felt with his touch, she couldn't afford to let her guard down. They climbed the stairs and were greeted by the pilot, a man in his fifties who looked like he could use some fattening up. David held back to inform the pilot of their plans while Liam showed Kira the plane. Two bedrooms huddled side by side in the back of the aircraft. One was done in chrome and black leather, such guy décor. The other was done in a welcoming combination of navy blue, white, and lighter wood. They each had a private bathroom, complete with a pulsating shower head. Just off the bedrooms were a sitting area, a large flat screen, three overstuffed leather love seats, two of them facing each other, and a few soft lamps. Beyond that was a kitchen and bar and another bathroom. Staff members hurried here and there, working hard to stay out of Liam and Kira's way during the tour. Excuse me, sir. If you'll approve the menu, I can sign off on the food, said a woman whose name tag read Kinsey. Liam took the sheet and read over it. Will you find me some pills, Kinsey? Yes, Mr. Bernhard. Anything specific? I have one of my headaches. Okay, sir. Kira cringed at the exchange. Pills? Coupled with Liam's over-exuberance during the ceremony and his crash in the car, Kira didn't like the picture Liam painted. Would you like to change clothes before we lift off? asked a woman dressed in a black pantsuit. Kira jolted from her suspicions. Not feeling needed at the moment, and looking forward to taking off her dress, she replied, yes, thank you. The woman introduced herself as Ella, Mr. Benhard's personal assistant. 
Ella took her to the Croman Black Master bedroom. Kira stared at the king-size bed, so out of place on an airplane, and yet it fit right in with Liam. She wondered what his house was like. I'll bet there's a fireman's pole from his room to the kitchen and a slide off the deck. After changing into a pair of black leggings, a fitted purple shirt, and an oversized fluffy cardigan, Kira dug out her essentials bag and went to the bathroom to brush her teeth. The bag had small containers of shampoo and conditioner, but she couldn't find her toothpaste. She debated borrowing some from Liam and opened a drawer. Not finding the toothpaste, she blinked at the number of prescription medications that rattled with the movement. Shutting the drawer, Kira opened the medicine cabinet to find another stash of orange bottles. She squinted to read the labels. Fentanyl. Methadone. Oxycodone. Painkillers. 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 She shut the door and stepped back. There were enough meds on this plane to host a rager. Kira put her hand over her mouth. Is that how they made their money? Had she married a drug trafficker? Forget brushing her teeth, she had to get off this plane. A vibration started under her bare feet. Kira stared at the floor for a moment before realizing they were taxiing down the runway. Running as fast as she could, she stubbed her toe on the bed. Grunting against the pain, she wrenched the door open. Ella was waiting for her. You'll need to take a seat for takeoff. But I, Kira gestured towards the bathroom. I can secure your belongings, Mrs. Bernhard. Ella directed Kira to a seat across from David and next to Liam, who was looking a little worse for wear. David nodded her direction before going back to the laptop open on his lap. The engines picked up speed and Kira's stomach dropped as they left the earth. For the time being, she was trapped. Trapped on the plane and trapped in this marriage. This cannot be happening, again. Kira scooted to the far edge of the couch and hugged the arm. Please, dear Lord, help me find a way out of this. Not long after the pilot announced their cruising speed and altitude, Kinsey delivered a small cup with some pills and a soda to Liam. He took both with a thank you, swallowed the pills, and handed the rest of the soda back to Kinsey. Kira watched the whole thing with wide-eyed terror. She checked David to see if he had anything to say about his brother downing major prescriptions right in front of them, but David's eyes stayed locked on his computer screen. Fifteen minutes later, Liam's head rolled to the side and he breathed deeply. Kira relaxed, seeing the childlike way he curled up against the armrest. Whatever he'd taken had put him out. Kira worked with several patients who had become addicted to prescription painkillers. It was awful for them, and they were often embarrassed. Still, she'd never seen an assortment of meds like the one in Liam's bathroom. He had a problem, and was most likely sharing if he carried that much with him on his travels. Her fear abetted for the moment, Kira asked Kinsey for a blanket. When she arrived, Kira draped it over Liam's sleeping form. He won't notice, said David, his eyes never lifting. Kira brushed her hand over Liam's forehead, checking his breathing. He seemed to be fine and showed no signs of an overdose. Then he won't be upset. David turned his piercing gaze on her. Why would you worry about upsetting him? Kira shrugged. Sitting on the edge of her seat, she tucked her hands between her knees. Habit, I guess. I was always worried about upsetting my first husband. David met her gaze. Did he hurt you? Kira turned away. You don't have to tell me. She didn't have to tell him, but she could hear the hope in his voice. I don't want to talk about it. You can trust me, he said in a low and inviting tone. Kira snorted. Trust drug dealers, right? Slapping her hand over her mouth, Kira wondered if those would be her last words. 
Instead of jumping across the aisle to strangle the life out of her or telling Ella to throw her out the open door, David jerked back as if she'd slapped him, drug dealers? He ran his hand through his hair, musing it in an attractive, just rolled out of bed way. You're joking, right? Not pleased that he thought her dumb enough to fall for his pretended innocence, Kira said. Do you guys host parties or just hoard the stuff for your personal use? David leaned forward, his eyes taking on a hard edge. That's not funny. Kira opened and closed her mouth. She'd been so worried about the type of man she married that she hadn't given much thought to being alone with his brother. Terror spiked through her arms and chest, immobilizing her limbs. Jack had been bad enough, and there was one of him, now she had two men to deal with. Don't ever joke about Liam's sickness to me again. Shoving to his feet, David stormed into the kitchen, where he pulled a plate from the cupboard and threw it to the ground, where it shattered. He. Crash. Can't. Crash. Die. He reached for another and Kira threw her arms over her head. One. Two. Three. For more plates, none of them coming anywhere near her. But the sound horrible, like hope and dreams and life splintering into a billion pieces in one violent stroke. When the racket stopped, she lowered her arms to find David breathing heavy, his chin to his chest and his feet littered with white shards. He looked up, anguish blotched across his face. Liam may have come to terms with dying, but I'm not ready to lose my brother. With that, he went into the smaller bedroom and shut the door. Kira turned to stare at her husband. Dying? Who said anything about dying? Liam was the picture of health, or so she'd thought. Re-evaluating his prominent cheekbones, the bags under his eyes, and his exhaustion, she saw a patient. He could have been any one of the dozens of people she worked with who were fighting for their lives. She raced to the bathroom and inspected the medications, recognizing several of them from work and her mother's treatment. Cancer. The very word carried a knapsack of emotions, emotions Kira had stuffed so deep she thought she'd never see them again. Yet here they were, wiggling their way free and demanding to be looked at and paid attention to and felt. Unable to stem the massive flood, Kira cried. She cried without restriction knowing that she could have lost her mom. All those fears of being orphaned and alone in the world were scary. Leaning against the glass shower door, she slid to the floor. Drained as she was, Kira wasn't done. She continued to sob, this time for the patients she saw every day, for their families who loved them and tenderly cared for them. Finally, she cried for Liam, who was so full of life it burst out of him like sunshine. Her husband was dying. David appeared in the doorway. Without a word, he scooped her up into his nicely shaped arms, as if she were a mere waif of a woman, and set her on her feet. The physical closeness was over fast enough to remain proper, and yet the sensations left behind lingered like the sweet scent of summer. I'm sorry. He patted her shoulder. I thought you knew. Kira shook her head. When Pamela recruited me, she said something about private nursing. Kira stifled a sob with her palm. I didn't connect the dots. It's okay. David pulled her into his arms. I'm sorry I yelled. The designer cologne and aftershave smell was fainter than it had been in the elevator, but being this close to David, the scent had a stronger effect. His arms were large enough to envelop her. She tipped her head up and met his troubled expression with one of her own. I'm okay. Good. His eyes dropped to her lips. Alarmed at the vibe she was getting, Kira placed her hands on David's very nice and very firm chest, pushing him away. Are you okay? I may never be okay, again. He dropped his hands to his side. No, I don't suppose you would be. She looked around, unable to watch David's suffering. What can I do? she asked. 
David yanked open a drawer, the medication bottles rattling. Whatever he asks. Within reason, he added. Kira placed her hand on David's arm, and the air charged between them. I'd like to look over his treatment plan and medical history. There isn't one. He got the diagnosis and opted to let it take its course. No chemo? There wasn't a point. Kira chewed her lip. How long does he have? Three months, tops. Kira slumped against the counter. He's so positive. David chuckled. He's determined to do everything he wants before he goes. Hence Italian gelato. David picked up her left hand and ran his thumb over the ring resting on her third finger. Kira shivered at his touch. Hence you, he said. Kira moistened her lips. Well then, we'll just have to do all sorts of amazing things with him before. Then. What do you have in mind? Kira grinned. With Liam's money, a private plane, and some time, I think I can come up with a few ideas. For the first time since she'd met him, David smiled. The transformation was intoxicating to observe. The skin around his eyes wrinkled right up to his bad boy haircut. His lips, neither too big nor too small, what was she, Goldilocks, spread to reveal straight teeth, and the cleft in his chin deepened. I look forward to it, he said, his voice husky and implying he'd like to look forward to a lot more than a few fun outings. Chapter 6 Liam closed his eyes and memorized the sound of Kira's laughter. If he were a poet, which he most definitely was not, then he could describe the sound with musical words. Better yet, if he were an artist, he could paint her laugh so the whole world could see it at a glance. Except Liam wanted to keep the beauty of Kira all to himself. He could fold her up like an origami swan and tuck her next to his heart forever. Despite their short time as man and wife, most of which he'd spent sleeping, the arrangement was as natural as his brotherhood with David or his childhood with his parents. Kira was family. Despite what his brother thought, Liam had prayed and pondered his marriage long before his actual wedding date. He'd always wanted to be a husband and a father. Dating with the intent to marry took time, and time was something he didn't have. Finding a Kira would have been impossible on his own, since he was dying and all. The remaining option was Pamela Jones. The more he'd looked into her services, the more he appreciated Pamela's professional approach to marriage mingled with a touch of pixie dust. He may never forget the look in her eyes when he walked into her office for the first time, like she knew something he didn't. Scusi, senor. The gelato vendor, a portly man in a splattered apron, managed to place five different flavors on one skinny cone, all the while making horrified faces at Liam's choices. Liam accepted the creamy masterpiece. Grazie. The flirty Italian, who had the top three buttons of his shirt open to reveal a carpet of dark hair on his chest, turned to Kiera. Per la donna? He wants to know what flavor, or flavors, Liam winked. You'd like. Kira bit her lip and peered into his open refrigerated cart, where a dozen containers of true Italian gelato lined up like paint on a palette. They'd arrived in Rome around 10 in the morning, exchanged dollars for euros, and made their way to the Fontana de Trevi. Thankfully, everyone had gotten some sleep on the plane, making the transition to a new time zone easier than it would have been if they'd stayed awake. A popular tourist site, the fountain had recently undergone a thorough cleaning and restoration. The result was that it all looked old. Which, Liam supposed, was the idea. A half dozen people wandered through the plaza, and a dozen more lounged on the Spanish steps, two of them dressed as gypsies playing a lyre and a tambourine. Their gelato dealer had barely opened shop when Liam, Kira, and David stepped up to order. He seemed to enjoy hemming it up for them, and Liam hoped the man had a buxom wife and a dozen children to surround him each night. Chocolate, said Kira, 
bringing Liam's attention back to their outing. Just chocolate? David scoffed. I thought you'd go rainbow like Liam. Kira shook her head, her brow serious. When it comes to gelato, I'm a purist. Liam slipped his arm around Kira's waist. The movement felt natural and relaxed between them, like they'd been friends for eternity. To his delight, Kira didn't resist. Come here often? He gave her his best smolder. Kira laughed again, an alto laugh, though he suspected that under the right circumstances she could produce a giggle in a higher key. Nope. This is my first time. But I admit, I'm something of an ice cream specialist. She took her cone and smiled. How so? He led her to the edge of the fountain, leaving David to order his cone and settle up with the vendor. David scowled as they walked away. Out of necessity, Liam ignored his brother's bad mood. When Liam allowed himself to think about being separated from his brother, his home, this earth, it dragged him down too. He had so little life left to live that he refused to spend it depressed. He and Kira sat side by side, their knees touching. I worked for Baskin Robbins my junior year of high school. Kira bit into her gelato. Bit it, like an apple, her beautiful white teeth sinking into the soft dessert. Ah, uh, I see. And were you a purist there too? He pointed to her plain chocolate cone. Nope. I tried all 31 flavors. And? And chocolate is still my favorite. She grinned, taking another bite. David sat down on the other side of Kira. What did you get? She asked. Vanilla, David and Liam said at the same time, David as the answer to her question, Liam to tease his brother. Kira scrunched her pert little nose. Vanilla is not a flavor. David looked at his cone, confused. Sure it is. Shaking her head, which made the light bounce off her long, dark hair, Kira said, nope. Vanilla is the base for real flavors. Like pistachio, mint, coconut, banana, and chocolate, Kira finished for Liam. She held up her cone, and he bumped it with his. If vanilla wasn't a flavor, they wouldn't have it on the menu, countered David. They have to put something out for those with poor taste. Liam winked at Kira. Kira chuckled. That was punny. Liam laughed. David groaned. You wanted to laugh. Kira bumped David, accidentally jostling his cone. David fumbled for a moment, his eyes going wide and his mouth gaping open. With a soft plop, the whole thing landed in the fountain. Kira gasped. Sorry, she squeaked. A man appeared at the side of the fountain with a net fastened to a long pole and extracted the cone. They were lucky it was just the cone. If David had fallen in, they could have been arrested. We're sorry, Kira apologized to him. He took one appreciative look from Kira's long legs to her big eyes and spoke rapidly in Italian, a huge grin on his face. What's he saying? Kira asked Liam, who shrugged. He says he'd be happy to buy you another cone. David shook moisture off his arm. Or dinner. His face darkened. And breakfast. The next thing Liam knew, David was knee deep in water, yanking on the net end of the pole. Shut it, or I'll shut it for you. He switched to Italian, his words becoming more forceful. The man dropped his end of the pole and threw his hands in the air. Palicia! Palicia! He pointed to David, who was standing in one of Italy's most treasured and legally protected fountains. He took off around a corner, still yelling for the police. David turned, sheepishly meeting Kira's questioning gaze. In the distance, Liam heard the roar of an engine. No doubt the police were on their way. We've got to go. 
he motioned to both Kira and David, who stared at one another in the strangest way. People, we have to move, Liam insisted. Why would you do that? Kira asked. David sloshed a few steps, his clothes soaked. He had no right to. To dishonor you that way. Kira blinked, her eyes brimming with unshed tears. Thank you. The roar of an engine bounced off the buildings on either side of the narrow street leading into the plaza. Liam grabbed Kira's hand. Move now, cry later. Sorry. Kira used her free hand to brush at her cheeks. It's just. Later, Liam begged as he pulled her around the fountain, David splashed alongside them. Either Liam was weaker than he thought or Kira was dragging her feet. I don't want to spend one of my remaining days in prison, can we move? His words worked like a well-aimed cattle prod, and soon the three of them were running down an adjacent street, David leaving a trail of water behind them. There. David pointed to a metro sign. The trio hurried down the stairs. David fished wet coins out of his pocket and paid their fare. They hopped on the first train they came to and fell into the seats, breathing hard. Liam and Kira had made it all the way to the train with their hands clasped. Her easy acceptance of him was like a blanket right out of the dryer. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been close to a woman who didn't have a stethoscope or needle in her hand, and he couldn't believe what a difference it made. Swallowing against the swell of emotion in his throat, Liam casually dropped Kira's hand. Without the excuse of running from the Italian police, he wasn't sure she'd be comfortable with the contact. The last thing he wanted to do was frighten her off. Kira brushed her hair off her face. I've never run from the police before. Her smile could have lit the streets of Rome for a week. Really, said Liam. We do it all the time. Kira chuckled. My shoes are ruined. David stomped his foot and water squished out of the seams. Kira smothered her laughter with her hands. Plus, you dropped your gelato. David put both his hands over his heart as if he'd been wounded. I don't even remember what it tastes like. Ha! <laughs> Kira nudged David's wet foot with her shoe. That's what you get for ordering boring vanilla. David shook his head and smiled. Not an all-out beamer of a grin, the smile offered a glimmer of the brother who used to drive too fast and invite the whole school over for baseball games on the back lawn. Liam studied Kira out of the corner of his eye as she continued to joke about David's new wetsuit. Now that was punny, replied David. Who was this woman who had cast a spell over both the Bernhard brothers? She turned her exotic blue eyes on Liam and asked, pointing to the map over the door, where exactly are we going? Liam and David checked the sign. Looks like we're circling to the train station. Will that take us back to the airport? she asked. Why, do you have somewhere you need to be? asked David. No. I thought maybe you two had a plan or a bucket list or something. Liam glared at David. You told her? After meeting Kira, the idea of marrying her to nurse him through his death had taken a back seat to just wanting to be married to the woman. Liam had hoped to keep his illness a secret, at least for a while. He'd wanted to know what it felt like to be a whole man, to be married without death hanging over his shoulder. Shrugging off his disappointment, he decided 24 hours, in relation to his lifespan, was longer than he could have hoped for. David smirked and pointed at Kira. She thought you were a drug dealer. Uh. Dot. Kira waved her hands like she was trying to stop a runaway train. Not a real drug dealer. A prescription drug dealer. Liam raised one eyebrow. And that's different from a regular drug dealer? How? She squared her shoulders. Besides the whole breaking the law thing, I guess the biggest difference would be body piercings. Body piercings? Yeah, 
My patients who become addicted to painkillers don't have body piercings. Well, maybe a small nose ring or something. I'm guessing regular drug dealers. She trailed off. You know what, never mind. All that matters is that I know the truth. Smiling mischievously, she added, besides, it's a good thing I knew before the whole police chase thing. Would you have turned us in? Liam gave her his smolder once again. She thought about it for a moment. Probably. Really? David blinked. Well, yeah, I mean, I get paid either way and I'd already finished my gelato, so. Liam laughed. It's all about the gelato. He took out his phone and pulled up a map of Italy. So, get this. We can cross the whole country by train in just a couple of hours. So? David prompted. So, since you're already wet, I think we should swim in both the Adriatic and Tyrrhenian seas in one day. But my swimsuit is on the plane, protested Kira. I'll have Ella meet us at the train station. David pulled out his phone. It was wet, but still worked thanks to the waterproof case he insisted on buying. Train? You guys don't want to rent a car? Kira asked. Nope. I kind of feel like riding the rails. Liam had gotten used to doing what he wanted, following his whims like a child chasing a butterfly. Traveling with David was easy. He wouldn't complain about riding all day in wet clothes. Guys were like that. Now that he had a wife, Liam needed to think of a woman's preferences and comfort. They weren't rough and tumble, jump out of bed and go kind of people, at least his mother was not. And Kira, with her long hair and perfect makeup, might slow them down. He tucked away a grin, the weight would be worth it. She was stunning. If you'd be more comfortable in a car, we can certainly get one. Oh, I'm okay, either way. I don't think I've ridden on a train before. Ever. Her eyes began to sparkle. This will be new for me. Liam felt her energy and enthusiasm as if it were his own. He reached for her hand and this time held on. She didn't know it yet, and Liam was just beginning to realize it himself, but being married changed a person, it was changing him. Chapter 7 The Adriatic Sea was cold. Liam dived in and came up gasping. Kira worked her way into the water, squealing each time a wave hit. David walked out, his jaw clenched in determination. Shivering, Kira clutched her arms across her body. Does this count? I'm counting it. David ran for shore. An older Italian couple, dressed in long pants, running shoes, and scarves, pointed and laughed at the crazy American as he barreled out of the sea, splashing and flipping water. Few people walked the beach, and David was quite the show. Though the chill crept into his bones, Liam stroked farther out. His last time in the Adriatic, he wanted to let it in his fibers, sear into his memory so he couldn't forget the experience. On the cusp of being tired, Liam's thoughts turned dark, and he wondered if freezing was a kinder way to go than what lay ahead. Liam, Kira called. Hearing her voice over the water was a small miracle, which reminded him he still had some life to give. After a quick shake off, David checked the train schedule on his phone. If we hurry, we can make the next train and have plenty of time on the beach before dinner. Let's hurry, then. Liam's muscles and joints were tight from the cold. Enjoying the experience, because it was new and different and because he had tuned into his body in a way a young man rarely does, Liam concentrated on the aches. Kira walked beside him, allowing David and Siri to plot the course. You're quiet. Are you all right? I'm hurting, but I want to. Why would you want to hurt? She adjusted the towel she'd wrapped around her waist. They hadn't brought a change of clothes, 
their meeting with Ella in Rome was short as the conductor called their train, and the three of them could pass for beach bums. Liam slowed his steps as they entered an open-air market where vendors sold leather jackets and purses, bright-colored scarves and hats, stationery, and flip-flops. Tourists wandered back and forth between booths, their knapsacks bulging with bargains. I want to feel all there is to feel. Good and bad. Before I can't feel anymore. Kira opened her mouth, but Liam held up his finger. The one thing I refuse to feel is sorry for myself. So don't try and placate me or tell me everything is going to be all right. Okay. Kira started walking again, and Liam matched her slow stride. I was thinking about this last night. We have five senses, right? He needed to talk to someone about the reasoning and musings he did in the quiet hours. David was a great action guy, fun to take on an adventure, but he didn't like to delve into theology or talk about serious matters. Liam was testing the waters with Kira. If she couldn't handle his deeper thoughts, then he would truly be alone in this world, and that was a scary idea. Right, she encouraged him on. Well, taste, touch, and smell all happen within the body. But sight and hearing can happen without a body, like a spirit can see and hear. I guess. Well, I want to taste, touch, and smell while I still can. Kira was quiet for a moment. Liam listened to the sound of tennis shoes on cobblestones and a child asking for a sweet. Do you think that's why we rely on sight and hearing so much? Kira asked. Liam lifted one side of his mouth. I'm not sure I follow. But he wanted to. Most people would have felt sorry for him, he'd seen enough looks of pity to last two lifetimes. Not his wife. Either she was indulging him, for which he would like her all the more, or she had boarded his train of thought and was taking it to the next station, for which he could confirm she was his soulmate. Well, if we could see and hear before we were born, then we would have relied on those two senses to gather information. When we're born, we use what we know, and the other three senses are like a bonus. Liam grasped her hand and kissed her knuckles. I think that's very likely. Which of the three is your favorite? Taste. Liam licked his lips, the salty sea lingered. Kira laughed. I should have guessed. David joined them. We need to pick up the pace. He pointed to his phone. Aware of his role as husband and provider, Liam stopped in the middle of the market. Kira, if you'd like to change, we can miss this train and catch the next one. I didn't bring my suitcase. Kira lifted her shoulders. Besides, the whole point was to swim in both seas in one day. We can still make it. Liam waved his hands. Everything you could need is right here. Kira spun in a slow circle. Maybe just a skirt. She pointed to a display of peasant skirts. David dashed over, pulling wet cash out of his back pocket. Kira laughed as he shoved a skirt, a blouse, a scarf, and a new pair of strappy sandals into her arms. She donned it all right in the middle of the street, ignoring the raised eyebrows. You look like a gypsy, said Liam. I feel like a gypsy. Kira lifted her arms and swiveled her hips. Liam felt a spark of something he hadn't in a long time, desire, a feeling he'd like to experience more before he didn't have the body to do so. Train, David demanded, cutting through the charged atmosphere with his insistence. They power-walked the rest of the half-mile to the station, making it on board before the porter shut the doors. Chapter 8 The ride from the east coast to the west coast was tepid and beautiful. A strange mix of ancient and just old passed by the open windows, accompanied by the clack-clack of the wheels and the swaying of the car. Villas, hillside vineyards, and farms provided a steady dose of the Italian experience. 
Kira reminded Liam to take his meds, not the heavy painkillers he took on the flight, but a lighter dose. She'd watched him swim farther and farther out into the sea, her heart pounding against her ribs. When she couldn't take it anymore, when the fear of losing him grew too strong, she called out, and he'd returned without hesitation. That one act had permeated her with trust in Liam. Twenty minutes after taking his pill, his whole body sagged. Fighting against the drag was a battle he wasn't going to win. The crowded train didn't leave much room for him to stretch out, so Kira had him lay his head in her lap. She dragged her fingers through the short hair on the back of his head over and over again, until he fell asleep. Twisting in her seat, she continued to play with Liam's hair while the world flew past the window. Being around someone who was so open about dying should have been depressing, but being with Liam was thrilling, fun, and she found herself contented with where she was, who she was, and whom she'd married. David returned a short time later from the convenience store set up in the back car. His arms were loaded with bags of chips, animal crackers, sub sandwiches, and colas. He plopped into the seat across from Kira and took in the scene. You two seem comfortable. He dumped his loot into the empty seat beside him and sorted through it. Kira shifted. He needs sleep. Uh, ha. Huh. And he just happened to land in your lap. David popped open a bag of chips. Kira looked down at Liam's face, so peaceful and content. The effects of their whirlwind Italian tour faded as he slumbered. She rested her hand on his shoulder. I don't know what it is with him. I feel. She grasped for the correct word. Safe. No, that's not right. I mean, I do feel safe. It's something else. Her eyes drifted back out to the green hills and blue skies. It's not something I'm used to, so I'm not sure I can describe it. David grunted and went back to sorting the food. Ham or turkey? Turkey. Kira accepted the sandwich and did her best to eat without dropping crumbs. As she chewed, she pondered David's reaction to her and Liam. He seemed almost jealous. And why shouldn't he be? Kira had waltzed into their boys' club and planted herself right next to his brother. Maybe David was upset that she was taking Liam's time, their time, and Liam's attention. Oh. He reached over to the pile of snacks and pulled out a small bar of chocolate. The highest quality available on a cross-country train, for the purest. How did you know? Kira joked. Their hands brushed, sending warmth up her arm and flooding her body. Listen, David. Kira wrapped the remainder of her sandwich and set it aside. If I am in the way, I can go. David stopped mid-bite. Go? Yeah, I don't want to take away your time with Liam. If you'd rather it just be the two of you, I understand. You think I want you to leave? Well, you sounded upset that I'm here. She gestured to Liam lying across her lap. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to take your place. David snorted. That's not what I think. Then why? He looked at his brother and then abruptly got to his feet. I'm going to get some water, do you want some? Confused at what she'd done to make David upset with her, Kira shook her head. Feeling the warmth leave right along with David, Kira slid her hand over Liam's chest. He snuggled his back deeper into the seat and sighed. At least one of you is glad I'm here, Kira whispered. She didn't see David for the rest of the ride. He joined them right as they were about to get off. She hung back, thinking it would be best to let the brothers make plans instead of jumping in. Which way's the beach? David's tone carried a false note of cheer. Liam gave him a look. Siri says go left four blocks, and our destination is on the right. Let's get on with it. Ella secured a villa not far from here and will have a car pick us up at six, 
dinner will be waiting. David moved ahead. Sounds heavenly. Liam chuckled. What if heaven really is an Italian villa with all-you-can-eat pasta al dente? David shook his head and started off. Kira watched him go, her heart troubled. Don't mind him. He's been grumpy since he heard his brother was dying. Liam offered his hand. Kira took it, unsure if being close to Liam in front of David was a good idea. I can't blame him. I was scared and hurt and angry watching my mom go through chemo. Liam's steps slowed. Your mom has cancer? Had. She's in remission. How long ago? She was diagnosed three years ago. It was a tough time. Not just because of the cancer, Kira had been married to Jack for just three days before he began tearing her apart. Nothing she did could please him, and more often than not she'd cry herself to sleep. The next morning, he'd tell her she looked like an alley cat with mange and insist she clean up before leaving her room so as not to offend him. Jack never laid a hand on her, but he'd beaten her up every day for four months. Spiritually and emotionally battered, she'd escaped to face the possibility of losing her mom. Is she doing well? Her first marriage would be tucked away, far away from where it could cloud Liam's brightness. He didn't need to carry any of her sorrow, not now and not ever. As well as can be expected. In fact, I should call her tonight and at least leave a message. You're close? We've been living together to save money. Chemo isn't cheap. Liam grinned. Yet another reason to avoid it. They reached the sand and kicked off their sandals. Liam took off at a sprint. Last one in the water has to wash dishes tonight. David dropped his bag and took off after Liam. Kira followed a little slower, letting them have their race. She'd done dishes every night since she was old enough to reach the sink, and would do them every night for the rest of her life if it would get David's smile back. Chapter 9 by the time they retired to a villa in Gaeta, Liam had sand in places he didn't want to think about, and Kira had a nice tan line on her beautifully sculpted shoulders. A warm dinner of sausage tortellini filled the sandstone house with tantalizing aromas and a feeling of contentment. Ella had added her signature touches, truffles on the pillows, shampoo and soap in the showers, and fresh flowers on the table in the entryway and dining room. She took care of so many details, Liam and David didn't think about how the chef was paid or who would return the rental car. Though the ability to survive and even thrive without concern had been what he'd asked for, it allowed too much time to contemplate life, the universe, and everything in between. In the past, he'd kept these thoughts to himself. That was no longer an option as his time grew short. Leaning back, his right arm crooked over the seat back, Liam asked Kira, what do you think death is like? He had his own ideas, but wanted her perspective. She'd face this with her mom, and, heaven bless her for it, she was facing death with him. Her ability to discuss the subject would ease much of his loneliness. David also turned his full attention to Kira, who swirled a piece of bread through the sauce on her plate. Liam judged David's mood and found him open to the conversation. I've seen a few people d. her eyes flicked to David and she amended her word choice. Pass on. For the person leaving, there's this piece that envelopes them. Yeah, Liam took a sip of water. But do they have chocolate in heaven? She tossed her hair out of her face. Where do you think the first cocoa beans fell from? They chuckled. How do the families handle it? Liam pressed. Kira dropped the bread onto her plate and wiped her fingers on a napkin. Every person handles it in a different way. There are several types of grievers, and within those, they vary by degrees. As a nurse, you learn to work with each one. What do you mean by different types? 
David leaned back in his chair and threw one arm over the seat back, mimicking Liam's posture. Liam smiled, even when he left, David would carry pieces of him. He'd never be forgotten, not really. Kira took a deep breath. Some people use humor to get through. They joke about dying, about losing 150 pounds in a day, stuff like that. That's you. David pointed at Liam. Kira smiled at the two of them. Others feel the need to control what they can in an uncontrollable situation. They pick out a casket, plan the funeral, pre-order flowers, that kind of thing. That's you too. David tipped his glass towards Liam. Oh. Kira cocked her head. He has his coffin, burial suit. He even knows where he wants to be when he passes on. He tipped his glass towards Kira, acknowledging her use of a kinder term than dying. Not wanting to bring their conversation to a grinding halt, which discussing the details of the plan always seemed to do with David, Liam asked, Are there more types? Kira nodded. Sure. Some people can accept that it's happening on one level, but they think that if they push it away, it won't come to pass. That's you. Liam pointed at David. He hates to talk about it. That's natural, and each person should be allowed to grieve in their own way and come to terms with things in their own time. She considered David. It might be helpful if you had someone outside the situation to talk to. I'll keep that in mind, he grumbled. Liam caught Kira's eye and gave a little shake of his head. She dropped the get a therapist talk and continued. Then, there are those who refuse to face reality. They continue on as if nothing is wrong. Their behavior can seem cold and offensive, but in reality, they suffer deeply. Liam and David said, Mom. At Kira's questioning gaze, Liam attempted to explain. Dad died over a year ago from the same thing. In fact, it was because of him that I went in for a screening. We both did, muttered David. Kira reached for Liam's hand under the table. Liam laced their fingers together, once again unbelieving of the circumstances that brought Kira into his life. When I told mom, she went cold and shut me down. I call and it's the celebrity dinner this and the auction that. She doesn't mind hearing about what we're doing as long as we don't mention doctors, hospitals, tests, cell count, or medications, David added. I can burn through my inheritance, but I'm not allowed to get cancer, Liam groused. Money can be replaced. Children can't. Kira's voice was like a warm hug on a cold day. Do you want kids? Liam asked. Kira withdrew her hand, her cheeks turning crimson. Um, dot. Liam laughed at her reaction. Not now. She sipped her water. Well, prodded David. Kira squared her shoulders. I'd love children, a family, chaotic Christmas mornings, a blanket fort in the living room, all of it. It sounds like heaven, said Liam, thinking that she had described his paradise to A.T., I hope you get it. Patting his very full and bloated stomach, Liam smiled. I think I'm ready for another one of those pills. The big ones. Kira set her napkin on her plate. They're in your medicine cabinet. Tuck me in? Liam asked, doing his best to look pitiful and hopeful at the same time. Kira laughed. Fine. Great. He jumped to his feet and grabbed her hand. Will you tell me a story? Liam couldn't explain why he reverted to his childhood request. He almost remembered his parents lifting the blankets across his shoulders and kissing his forehead. As they'd talked about his mom and dad, he'd felt a need to be coddled and cared for. Like all his years as a grown-up had flown off to Neverland. Just one. And it's short. Good night, Liam called over his shoulder to David. Night, David replied. 
Liam changed into his pajamas in the bathroom, brushed his teeth, and presented himself to Kira. I'm ready. Kira shook her head and pulled back the covers. Liam hopped in. She handed him a pill and a bottle of water. He made short work of them both before burrowing into the five pillows Kira had arranged for him. She would make an excellent blanket and pillow fort. How do you know where to put the pillows? They teach us in nursing school, she replied as she pulled the blankets up. You know, they say the older you get, the more childish you become. Then David must be exactly middle-aged. Liam snorted. He wasn't always like this. He used to be fun. No! Kira gasped in false astonishment. Liam stared at the blanket. In some ways, cancer stole my brother too. Aww! Dot. Kira sat on the bed next to him and ran her fingers through his hair. I like it when you do that. It feels nice. Like you care. Good. Because I do care. Liam rolled to his side, facing Kira. Thank you, he said, before relaxing into her touch and drifting to sleep. Chapter 10 Kira stayed at Liam's side a few more minutes, contemplating how she could already care for a man she'd known for just a couple days. Though, it didn't seem like they'd only known one another for that short of time. Giving him a kiss on the forehead, she slipped from the room, leaving the door ajar so she could hear him in the night if needed. Her room was across the hall and just as beautiful as Liam's with granite tile floors, rough textured walls painted in cream and then oiled to make them look as old as the city, and a king-size four-poster bed with gauzy fabric circling the red and gold coverlet. Her suitcase was tucked away in the walk-in closet, and her clothes had been hung on the racks or laid on the shelves. The swimsuit and cover-up she'd shucked before dinner had been washed and dried while she ate. She fingered the fabric, her eyes blurring with unshed tears. As much as she took care of others, having someone look after her was a rarity that allowed her to be weak and safe all at the same time. She changed into her long-sleeved cotton pajamas and folded her jeans and shirt to give her tears time to dry before leaving her room. Contemplating her odd connection with Liam, she made her way to the kitchen to tackle the dishes. Intent on saving the staff at least this small task, she rolled up her sleeves, only to find David at the sink. The muscles in his arms bulged and clenched in the most attractive way as he attacked a plate with a scouring pad. Those calendars with the firefighters had it all wrong. A hot guy doing dishes was the way to go. Hey! Put down the bubbles and back away. Kira bumped David aside. I lost the dare fair and square. She took the suds-covered scouring pad, grabbed the plate from his hands, and rinsed both under warm water. David shook the water off his fingers. I'll dry. Gone was the smile and rough and tumble older brother from the beach. Instead of trying to cheer him up, Kira allowed him the chance to just feel rotten about things. They fell into an easy rhythm, each one elbow deep in their own thoughts. Kira asked the question that had been nagging at her since their conversation at dinner. Do you believe we existed before birth? What do you mean? David stacked the last plate on the counter. Leaning his hip against the cabinet, he looked like Mr.'s June, July, and August all rolled into one with his shirt straining across his shoulders and his biceps all round and big. Kira ducked her head. Is it possible that we, well, not we as in you and me, but that people could have known each other before they were born? She hazarded a glance and found David's brow lowered and his shoulders hunched. Sorry. If you don't want to talk about this stuff, it's okay. David scratched his five o'clock shadow. I'm fine talking about birth, it's the other direction I don't want to face. Kira picked up a glass and swirled the soapy washcloth around the lip. We're all headed that direction. I guess it's possible, David continued. Is it probable? I don't know. 
There have been billions of people born since time began. If you don't believe in reincarnation, then that's a lot of souls all together in heaven, which is what, as big as space. So the likelihood of being born at the same time as a, what would you call them, heavenly friend? Let alone being born on the same street or country or even continent would be pretty slim. Kira nodded. Unless it was part of God's plan. Well, they say that with God, all things are possible. They? You don't believe that? David dried the glass. I can't even begin to understand how God can let my brother D. pass on. I mean, did he give Liam cancer? Kira set a used glass in the sink. I've had several patients and their families ask the same question. What do you tell them? Nothing that soothes the pain or makes it okay. I just say that our bodies are imperfect and mortal and will remain that way until the resurrection. Which is a free gift. Everyone will be resurrected and be made whole. We'll all be together again in eternity, surrounded by God's perfect love. That's a nice thought. Kira washed the last fork and dropped it in the sink to rinse. It was the one thought that got me through my mom's chemo. Knowing I could lose her, after all I'd done, the hours of pleading for her life before the Lord. He never promised me she'd stick around. He didn't? No, she placed her hand on his. But he promised I would see her again. David turned their hands and brushed his thumb across her wedding ring. Kira's heart did a backflip. Goodbye is the hardest word in the world to learn, but hello can be the sweetest. It lingers on the tongue and offers everything from hope to thrills and some very strange things happening in here. David took her wet hand between his and pressed her palm over his heart. Kira's pulse matched his pound for pound. Her mouth went dry. I see what you mean. Do you? David's gaze delved into her, heating her tummy and spreading like frosting on a warm cake. Needing something firm, solid, and not David to hold on to, Kira tore her hand away from his chest and gripped the cold granite countertop. David looked down to where she'd left a small handprint on his shirt. I think it would be best if I turned in. Yeah, Kira breathed. Yeah, he echoed, walking backward until he bumped into the wall. Kira giggled. Wall, he said, pointing to it. Wall, she echoed. He patted it. Good wall. Very sturdy. Kira laughed as he made his way down the hallway. She turned back to the dishes to avoid a last look. David was all too fun to look at, but she was a married woman. Married to one of the sweetest, most wonderful men on the plant. She wanted to make every moment he had left a good one. With that in mind, she finished up the dishes and decided to get a good night's sleep so she'd be in top form for their outing in the morning. Chapter 11 Liam walked gingerly to the breakfast table using the wall, the counter, and then a chair for support. His head pounded, spun, and stomped, and his stomach rolled in protest. Awful how those two parts of the body were connected. Kira glanced up from her saucer of hot chocolate and let out a startled cry. Having caught a glimpse of himself in the hallway mirror, Liam knew her alarm was well founded. Dark circles had set up camp under his eyes, and his skin was as white as the marble statue in the courtyard. Unlike him, Kira looked stunning in her striped yoga pants and running shirt. She had a fit body, one that moved easily and with grace. Her hair was pulled back in a braid, and wisps framed her face. She must have made use of the gym at the other end of the house before settling in for breakfast. The villa came furnished, which made moving in with a day's notice all that much easier. Bless Ella for her massive organizational skills that bordered on miracle work. Kira was beside him, lifting his arm and settling it over her shoulders. Hey, baby, he whispered in what he hoped sounded like an intimate tone but may have come off as breathless sick guy. 
Can't a guy have breakfast without you plastering yourself all over him? Kira blushed. In your dreams, hubby. All night long. Liam slumped into the chair next to hers. Hubby? Kira's blush deepened. It just kind of came out. I like it. He remembered her tender touch as she tucked him in last night. Picking up her hand, he kissed her fingers. I like other things too. Like what? asked David. The jerk strode in, all healthy morning glow, confidence, and a crooked smile for Kira, who rivaled the terracotta wall art for red. Kira's new pet name for me. Liam smirked. His limbs hung heavy, and pain stabbed his back. He didn't want to think about why. Kira put her hand on her hip, her curvy and beautiful hip. Okay, Casanova, time to tuck you back in. She helped him from the chair and wrapped her arm around his back. See, David, she can't wait to get me in bed. He kissed Kira's cheek. I have that effect on women. Kira chuckled. David harumphed. I'll bring in some of this hot cocoa, and we'll have a picnic while we wait for your pill to kick in, Kira offered. Liam glanced over his shoulder. You're not invited, he told David. Ella met them in the hall just outside his room. The scooters will be here in a half hour, and I made reserva. She cut herself off when she looked up from her tablet and took in Liam's shuffled steps. Never mind. Liam lifted his fingers. Thank you, Ella. I know you've spent the morning arranging things for us. Please give David the information. He and Kira will be ready to leave soon. No. I'm staying. Kira's braid brushed his arm, and he was sorely tempted to take her up on that offer. He pointed to the bed, and they made their way that direction. Unless you're going to crawl in with me, you're going. Liam, Kira said, a hint of reproach in her voice, you are my husband, and I will stay with you. Liam placed his hand over his heart. Darling, you've made me the happiest man on earth. Please allow me the dignity of managing this on my own. It's not so bad that a day of R and R won't have me chasing you through the streets of Rome tomorrow. Maybe even tonight. Rome? Kira helped him under the covers. The Sistine Chapel, tomorrow. If I need something, Ella will be here. I don't want you missing out on the moped tour. Sounds thrilling. Kira brushed her fingers over his brow. Wait till you see the scooters. Liam grimaced at the needle Ella carried. He'd never been a big fan of needles, preferring to swallow pills, but the shot would take effect much faster, and the pain was begging to stop. Do you mind? Ella asked Kira. I've never. Of course. Kira took the needle in her capable hands. Ella provided an alcohol wipe, which Kira used to disinfect his arm before inserting the needle. Shifting, Ella gabbed. It's fine, ma'am. I've stayed with Mr. Bernhard before. I don't feel good about leaving you. Kira handed the used needle to Ella, who carried it as far away from her body as possible as she left the room. I can't rest knowing David's moping around here all day, stressing out. Stress is bad for the body. He's going to have a heart attack and be the one to greet me at the pearly gates. David's fine. It's you. Liam placed his finger over Kira's delicious-looking lips. He'd have to find a way to see if those lips were as sweet as they promised. I'm asking as a friend and as your husband, help him laugh again. I want my brother back before I die. The medication spread through his circulatory system. Please. Kira's eyes brimmed with tears. Okay. What did you call me, he mumbled. Kira laughed. Hubby. That's me. He relaxed into the mattress and was soon asleep. 
Chapter 12 Kira changed into a pair of teal capris and a white peasant blouse Trish had insisted she purchase the day before the wedding. At the time, she hadn't thought much about the shopping spree, knowing that her closet was in desperate need. Now, she wondered how much Trish had known about Liam's situation and A.D.D. personality that she didn't tell. The marriage had been rushed and semi-haphazard, which she understood considering the circumstances, but perhaps she was the only one who felt that way, because she was the only one who didn't know Liam was dying when they said, I do. Still, she could have backed out at any time. She didn't have to climb into that limo with Liam and David. She didn't have to get on the plane and fly to Italy. For some reason, she continued forward, like this was the only path ahead. Deciding to take a page from Liam's book, she brushed off her questions about the future and finished getting ready by adding a chunky salmon bracelet and scarf to her ensemble. Lastly, she unwound her long braid and finger combed the waves. A tap sounded at her door, and David's voice floated through the crack. Are you ready? Kira pulled the door all the way open. Whoa! David had on a pair of khaki pants and a black polo shirt with a pair of aviators tucked in at the buttons. His dark champagne-colored hair had been tousled, and his cheeks had a just-shaved shine. Smelling like musk and soap, he was all rich man hotness with a tinge of sad. His natural confidence was doing strange things to her mental abilities, and that melancholy triggered her inner nurturer. She couldn't decide if she should run away or wrap her arms around him. She opted to run. Just let me grab my phone. David leaned against the door jam like a model on location. I wish I'd thought to pack a good camera. Why is that? David put his finger to his ear, indicating he hadn't quite heard her. Kira dropped her purse. Did I say that out loud? Um, you know. We're in Italy. Who knows if I'll ever make it back. Nice recovery. She moved to the doorway, but David didn't let her pass. Tradition says if you throw a coin over your shoulder into the Fontana de Trevi, you're destined to return one day. He searched her face, his gaze caressing her cheeks, her lips, and her jaw before returning to her eyes. Needing some respite from his intensity, she joked, what happens if you throw in a gelato? David's eyes crinkled. You get an all-expense-paid tour of an Italian prison. Or so I hear. Ooh. Fancy. He picked up the end of her scarf. This is fancy. She tossed her head. Yes, I thought it would look romantic fluttering behind me as I zoomed through the streets of Gaeta on my moped. You will be the picture of beauty. Their eyes met, and the air between them grew heavy with thoughts of being close, handprints on shirts, and longing. David stood straight. This way. He motioned for her to go first. Kira hurried ahead, intent on finding that line between distance and friendliness. They were greeted in the piazza by three shiny black scooters. David picked the biggest one. Kira took one of the smaller two. She glanced over at the empty seat and frowned. What? asked David, his voice as gentle as the breeze. I don't like running off and having a good time while he's sick. She wrapped her arms around her middle. It doesn't seem right. Welcome to my life. Excuse me? Never mind. No, what did you mean? David straddled the scooter but didn't start it up. He slouched and then scratched his neck. Both Liam and I had scans. Mine came back all clear, the picture of health. Liam's showed a tumor in his brain. He ran his hand down his face. I can't tell you how many times I've wished they mixed up the results and it was really my scan that came back with cancer. That it was me who would die. His hard eyes turned on the sky. Have you ever had a patient's family member pray they were taken instead? Did you? 
Kira fiddled with her scarf. I did not. There's a certain promise in this life that kids will outlive their parents. For me, it was natural that mom would go before me, the timing was just way off. I wanted her to see her grandkids. Kira's eyes burned with the memory and tears. I felt like I had failed her in the most substantial way. Do you still feel like that? David probed. Kira turned to take in her home away from home. Not in the last couple of days, I haven't. Something about being here, with Liam, feels right. Like I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I can't explain it the way I feel it. Sorry. She wiped the moisture off her cheeks. Don't be. You're a good brother, David. Kira weighted her words with a serious look. David twisted his mouth. If you don't want to go, we can hang here. Kira looked at the house. It was big and beautiful and filled with things to do, including swimming in the pool and watching movies on the big screen, but she doubted either of them would bring David out of his funk. Her guilt at being able to go riding, while Liam slept off their fun from yesterday, had given her new insight into David's perpetually bad mood. Liam asked her to make David happy. That was his idea, not hers. She had to look at today as a favor to him. Maybe that would help David too. I think we should go. You do? David's eyes widened. Yeah. She climbed on the scooter without an explanation. Telling him that he was bringing Liam down would add to his guilt, which would make cheering him up improbable. Neither would she divulge that Liam had given her an assignment. Ignoring his confusion, she found the start button. The lights came on, but the engine didn't purr. I think it's broken. David shook his head. They're electric. Kira was pleased she could hear him. He leaned over to reach the helmet hanging from the handlebars and put it on her head. Safety first. Liam would kill me if I brought his wife home with a scratch. Kira laughed. I'm not a car. David searched her face. You're a Bugatti, Kira. Don't ever think otherwise. Kira's heart pounded. She had no idea what a Bugatti was, but the reverence in David's voice told her it was something to be valued, she was to be valued. How different these men were from Jack. Though they all came from money, and lots of it, they weren't cut from the same cloth. Uncomfortable with the praise, she leaned back. Take it slow, at least at first. I've never driven one of these before. He lifted a shoulder. Slow it is. Kira released a breath as he put on his own helmet. How come your bike is bigger than mine? Because it makes me look like a bad A. Kira snorted. Yeah, that electric moped is really working it for you. She wouldn't admit it out loud, but David cut a mighty fine image on that scooter. He could ride that thing into the middle of a playground while carrying a dozen balloons and wearing a clown nose, and he'd still look hot. Yeesh. David jerked his head. Come on. I want to see the church. You really know how to impress a girl. He barked a laugh, and Kira made a note that he seemed to brighten up when she teased him. She should do that more. Maybe she could tease the old David out of his shell. They pulled out of the cobblestone drive, Kira keeping a steady eye on David's broad back. While teasing him might be what he needed, it was dangerous ground. Sullen David was manageable, Kira wasn't sure if she could handle a David who smiled, laughed, and, heaven forbid, teased her back. Chapter 13 Wow! Kira stared up the sweeping concrete stairs leading to the San Francesco church set on top of a hill overlooking the sea. You really know how to impress a girl. David grinned. Wait till you see it up close. The frescoes are amazing. 
Kira put her hand on the baluster for support as they climbed. How old is the building? It was built in 1222 to honor the time the Pope spent here during an uprising, making Gaeta the center of the Catholic Church for a short time. So I'm looking at a building that is older than my country. The Gothic-style architecture required ornamentation wherever the eye landed. Brought together, the result was as beautiful as it was bold. The symbols were delicate and purposeful. I guess I never thought of it that way. David moved closer to Kira to let an elderly couple pass. They clutched wrinkled hands and wore thick-soled shoes during their descent. The woman was in a flowered skirt, and the gentleman's silver hair hung to his chin. David brought her attention back to him by cupping her elbow. I grew up traveling the world and seeing things that were ancient. He gestured toward the stairs, and like pilgrims in need of a spiritual reawakening, they began their climb. I guess I kind of take things in at a global perspective. Well, I've never been outside the US, so it's kind of a big deal for me. They reached the top, stopping to let their legs rest for a moment. This was your first passport stamp? Yep. I had to get one to sign up with BMB. You weren't looking to travel? Kira rolled her eyes. Of course I wanted to travel. She sighed. But life sort of got away from me. David took her explanation in stride and continued the tour, giving her the background of basic architecture, arches, and the artists who painted and sculpted for the church. His hands moved slowly at first, tracing the roofline as he spoke, and then became determined butterflies swooping from one section of the building to the next. He threw out words like spandrel and triforium, all the while his eyes brightening. Kira's mind wandered away from his words and more towards his features before she decided to exile her gaze from David's face. Instead, she turned to observe a couple facing the ocean. The woman stood in front of the man, her hands on the banister, and he stood behind her, his arms wrapped around her middle and his chin next to her ear. They melded into one another. Their posture said they were comfortable with their proximity and their affection. Cocking her head, Kira wondered what it would be like to have David's arms around her, his fingers splayed across her stomach. Shall we go inside? David's question broke through Kira's dopey trance. Yes. She cleared her throat. I bet it's cooler in there. Kira fanned her face with her hand. Why do you know so much about this church? she asked, hoping to keep David's spirits up by keeping him talking. Architectural major. You're an architect? No. I'm an architectural major. Isn't that like saying I graduated from med school but I can't write a prescription? David scratched his jaw. I guess I don't feel like I've earned the title. What would it take? Seeing something I designed built. Ah. Uh. Kira started toward the front doors. A couple stopped on the threshold and exchanged a kiss full of love and tenderness. What is it with Italians and PDAs? She scowled as they stopped in the same place as the affectionate couple had been moments before. David must have thought her scowl was directed at him. You don't approve? Kira smiled. You're waiting for someone else to tell you what you are instead of defining yourself and shouting it out to the world. David stared at her, hard, pinning her in place with his intensity. Liam and I own half of our late father's property information company, which continues to grow thanks to booming sales in China. I get handed a lot of things in this world. Yeah, she squirmed. Architecture is in my veins. The first thing I ever drew was a treehouse for me and Liam. This title, this distinction, it's something I want to earn. Kira bit her lip. I've misjudged you. Perhaps. He stepped from the bright mid-morning sun and into the church. But no one could misjudge the beauty here. Nice to know I'm not a lost cause. Kira swung her hips as she entered the building. 
She threaded the scarf from her neck and draped it over her purse. The vaulted ceilings required all of her attention and neck muscles she'd been previously unaware of to appreciate. They spent an hour wandering through and around the church. After David released another bout of architectural what's what, he grew meditative and Kira allowed him some space. She circled the church several times, her mind working to take in every detail. The Italians left no wall space, floor space, or even ceiling space without decoration. With her senses overloaded, Kira made her way to the veranda overlooking the ocean. Resting her arms on the banister, she leaned as far over as she dared to look down where the waves met the rocky shore. She sighed as the salty breeze blew through her hair. A short time later, she sensed David nearby. Without a word, he leaned next to her, their arms close together. Kira turned to take in the tile rooftops and sand-colored buildings. Few people wandered the streets, and traffic was light. It's peaceful here. Like this spot of land is not part of the world where I live. Your world isn't peaceful? Hardly. The breeze picked up, and goosebumps broke out on her skin. David removed the scarf from her purse and wrapped it around her shoulders. What troubles could you have? You'd be surprised. He lifted an eyebrow in challenge. I will not lay my problems at your doorstep, David. You have enough of your own. David scooted next to her, their arms touching. See, that's the thing. Being here, with you, has. Well, I haven't thought about how horrible life is for at least twenty minutes. Kira laughed. Twenty whole minutes, huh? I'm impressed. You should be. Liam and I have been all over the world. We've hiked mountains, gone deep into the ocean, and pretty much lived Mardi Gras in an attempt to distract ourselves from reality. It hasn't worked. Every day I wake up there's this monster hiding under the bed. Instead of shrinking from the sunlight, it follows me all day long. I haven't been able to shake it. He put his hand over hers. This quiet day, with you, in this church, has touched a place in my heart. He paused. Brushing her cheek with his fingers, David's eyes went soft. I've never begrudged Liam anything, until now. He glanced at her lips, sending Kira's heart into a tailspin. She wanted his kiss. Somehow she knew it would be amazing, the kind of kiss that redirected her whole world. Don't. Kira pulled her hand away and twisted her wedding band around her finger. David glanced at her fidgeting and allowed her space, but his eyes didn't leave her face. I won't cross that line, Kira. I'm a stronger man than I let on. Then I haven't misjudged you after all. Perhaps not. He shook off the spell. Are you ready for dinner? Ella promised a traditional five-course meal. Sounds great. I'm famished. They made their way to the stairs, and Kira gasped at the beauty laid out before her. The late afternoon sun hung lazily in the sky painting the buildings with shades of sunflower, terracotta, canary, apricot, buff, and marigold. To their left, the sea ebbed and flowed, the waves crashing against the shore, silent from this distance but no less mesmerizing. This city was made for sunsets, David said near her ear, his breath warm against her neck. He continued on and was a third of the way down the stairs before she broke from the trance he'd created. He may not have crossed a line, but he couldn't turn off his raw sexy nature. Nor could Kira deny the fact that she was attracted to him. He was all sorts of wonderful, and if she didn't watch it, she'd find herself in a predicament. She hadn't married David and been glad because of this exact reason. Liam, with all his flirting, touching, and handholding, she could handle. She loved his spontaneity, his bubbling personality, and his open admiration of her. Liam was her husband, and to Liam she would be faithful. Not just because she'd said the words, 
but because she wanted to be that type of a wife for him, to give her best so there were no regrets. Trotting, she caught up and made her way to the smaller scooter, where she secured her own helmet before David could come close again. She may not be able to control the way her body and mind reacted to him, but she could keep him far enough away that she didn't have a reaction. Like an allergy, she'd just have to avoid the trigger. That should be easy enough to do as long as she stayed on her toes. Pressing the ignition, Kira listened for the beep, but none came. She tried again, this time focusing on the light around the speedometer. It stayed dark. What the? You coming? David's scooter inched forward. Oh, sure, his scooter started. It won't turn over or turn on or whatever. Kira tried once more before huffing. David put down the kickstand on his scooter and came over to try. Kira let out a nervous laugh. What? Your bad a bike has a kickstand. She covered her mouth. So does yours. He pointed down. Yeah, but my scooter's cute. Kickstands are expected on cute. He smirked. Pressing the button and holding it, he scowled when the dash stayed dark. Muttering something in Italian that Kira was pretty sure she got the gist of, David pulled out his phone. Ciao, Ella. Ciao? Kira rolled her eyes. When in Rome? David winked at her. We aren't in Rome. With an eye roll of his own, David went off in Italian, gesturing to her bike and throwing his hands in the air. Kira laughed at his antics. With a sigh, David ended the call. He looked from Kira to his moped and back. Well, lucky for you, I have a bad a bike. Kira's eyes went wide. She didn't like the way this was going. Lucky me, she squeaked. Yep. It happens to fit too. Kira gripped the handlebars of her moped. What about my scooter? Ella will send someone to get it within the hour. A delicious vision of holding David tight as they weaved through the sunset streets was more than Kira could withstand. I could wait and catch a ride with whoever comes to fix it. David shook his head. Liam's awake and waiting for us. Oh. What had looked like a big bike next to her one-seater could never hold all of David and all of her without forcing her to hold on to him. Okay, but I get to drive. She jumped off her scooter and hurried over to David's, taking possession of the front seat. I don't think so. Kira put her hand on her hip. That's my condition. I drive or I walk. It's seven miles. David mirrored her stance. No problem. I run thirteen every weekend. Which was the wrong thing to say, because David's eyes went to her legs. I can see that. At the end of her wit, she glared. Shut your mouth and get on the bike. Fine. But let the record show I tried to be a gentleman. He placed one hand on her hip and threw his long, muscular leg over the bike. Kira held back a squeal. You can't. She flushed. Touch me. David sighed. What am I supposed to hold on to? Kira searched the moped, but there weren't any handles or even finger grips. Fine. Just not too tight. Smirking, David said, I can do that. Both hands went to her waist, his touch feather light, the heat from his hands boiling the butterflies in her stomach. Why she thought this was a better option than holding on to him was beyond her. She pressed the ignition, the stupid bike starting on the first try, and pulled onto the street. The narrow alleys were quiet, most people already home for dinner. Pulling gently, David settled her back against him. What are you doing? She panicked and the moped wobbled. You can't drive sitting on the handlebars. Can too. She moved forward. 
I'd like to make it back to the villa without road rash, will you just relax? His voice held a hint of humor as if he enjoyed seeing her flustered, like he knew how he affected her. Stupid male ego. Blowing out all the air in her lungs, Kira shook her right foot as if she could shake out the bundle of nerves like the last cereal in a box of Lucky Charms. I've never driven with someone on the back, and now that I'm on it, this is a bad a bike. Yep. He gave her middle a light squeeze. This time Kira did squeal. Stop it. She swatted at him, sending the moped towards a parked car. Hey! David leaned over her and grabbed the handles. Encircled by his warm arms, Kira growled at the way her body betrayed her determination. Elbowing him in the gut, she knocked his arms away and took control. Gunning the accelerator would have been more effective if the machine had a gas engine to rev, but she was pleased to feel his hands go back to the relative safety of her hips as she picked up speed. Hang on, she called over her shoulder as she watched the speedometer climb. How fast was 55 kilometers anyway? She didn't care. The faster they got back to Liam, the better. Chapter 14 Liam lounged on the veranda, watching for Kira and David's return. He'd awoken half an hour before, and, thanks to the meds, his brain was still foggy. Nothing a good meal and some better conversation couldn't fix. Ella had hired a chef to prepare an authentic Italian feast, so the food was under control. With Kira around, the conversation should prove to be invigorating. That woman had fit into Liam's life, his heart, and his impending death better than he could have hoped. She was the first ray of sunlight in the morning and the brightest star in the evening sky all rolled into one stunningly beautiful package, her bedside manner was that of an angel. He'd woken up once today and regretted sending her away. Falling asleep would never be the same after falling asleep with her hands brushing through his hair. What he regretted even more was sending her on a fool's errand. David would not change his Oscar the Grouch ways in an afternoon. Poor Kira had probably been miserable all day long while dragging David's sorry but around town. Hopefully, she'd enjoyed the mopeds and seen something worth traveling across the globe to see. A scooter rounded the corner going much too fast, the bodies on board leaning in tandem. They stopped in front of the entranceway, and Kira jumped off so fast David had to grab the handlebars and steady the bike. Neither of them noticed Liam yet. Tell me again why I had to drive slow this morning? David asked. Phew. Kira pulled off her helmet and shook out her hair. You drive like a grandpa. David tipped his head back and laughed. He pulled off his helmet, his eyes dancing and his shoulders shaking. I'll get you next time, Bugatti. David's blue moods had weighed heavy on Liam's shoulders. How was a man supposed to die in peace when his brother was so sad? At the sound of David's laughter, a band that had restricted him snapped, and Liam breathed in his relief and expelled his worries. Kira wagged her finger. You'll have to catch me first. David lunged for her. Laughing, Kira dodged him and sprinted toward the house. Liam, she called when she saw him. You're up. Liam's heart jumped at the way her face brightened. He waved. Please Lord, give me just a few more days with this woman. Did you have a good day? he asked. Sitting next to him, she replied, I had a great day. She plopped a kiss on his cheek. Thank you. Liam put his arm over the back of the seat. David approached, his steps slower than Kira's but noticeably lighter. Who is this guy? Liam squinted up at him. He looks like someone I know, but I can't quite put my finger on it. David rolled his eyes. I'm starving. I think dinner is ready when we are. Let's eat. David led the way in, and Liam followed with his arm around Kira. He kissed her cheek. Thanks for bringing him back. 
Kira flushed. I, I didn't do anything. You don't have to. All you have to do is be yourself. You're like sunshine, gelato, and a grand slam all rolled into one. He didn't stand a chance. Kira slipped out from under his arm. I'm going to freshen up. I'll meet you in the dining room. I'll save you a seat. Liam was leaning against the wall when David came looking for him. What are you doing out here? Trying to decide what I did that was good enough to warrant Kira as my wife. Not a dang thing. David hooked his elbow around Liam's neck. You're the luckiest S.O.B. I've ever met. Funny how a woman changes things. A week ago I was the most unlucky person you've met, Liam joked. Maybe it's not luck, then. Karma? Like the universe said, sorry you got cancer, here's Kira to make up for that? David punched him in the shoulder. That's not how it works. Liam refrained from rubbing his arm, even though he wanted to. That was going to leave a bruise. Not that David had hit him hard. It was just that bruises seemed to appear out of nowhere these days. When you get to heaven, feel free to ask, what the hell? Surprised by David's lighter tone, and the fact that he'd talked about heaven, Liam stared at him for a moment. Can you swear in heaven, he asked, testing David's mood to see if it would stay. Sure you can. But they give you detention. Liam snorted. What? Do I have to pound erasers together? Where do you think clouds come from? This time, Liam laughed. And then he cried. Throwing his arms around David, he choked. I missed you. David hugged him fiercely. You've been here, but you weren't here. Liam sniffed. I know. I. Kira's door flew open. Her eyes went wide. Liam and David dropped their arms and shoved their hands in their pockets. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. She tucked her hair behind her ear. You didn't interrupt. David was choking, and I had to pound the stuff out of his windpipe. Liam offered Kira his arm. It was very dramatic, and I'm pretty much a hero now. Kira's cheeks twitched with a smile she had to work to keep hidden. You are so very brave. Superman's got nothing on me, Liam cooed. David groaned. If we don't eat soon, I'm going to disintegrate. They wandered into the dining room, where three waiters wearing tuxedos with tails stood at attention behind their chairs. Maybe we should have dressed up. Kira tugged at her blouse. You look beautiful, Liam assured her. A butler instructed them on the types of dishes, why they were served in that particular order, and expounded on the chef's abilities. After the introduction and the prosciutto, Liam leaned his forearms on the edge of the table. Kira, where did you grow up? Kira blinked a couple of times. She dabbed the corners of her mouth with her cloth napkin before speaking. So proper. Mom would love her. Thoughts of his mother brought on a wave of homesickness. He would rather have been in his old bedroom with his family close than traipsing about the world, but that wasn't possible with a mother who was in denial. He'd had to leave to protect her from the ugliness that grew inside him. California. He propped his elbow on the table and leaned his head on his fist. What was that like? Kira chuckled. Like you'd expect. Weekends on the beach. High school senior night at Disneyland. What about your dad? asked David. Dad left when I was two. As far as I know, he never looked back. But it was okay. She started to play with her fork. My mom was a school teacher at my elementary, so we spent a lot of time together when I was young. We formed a bond, and she was great about taking my friends to the beach or the park. 
I don't remember a time when she ever said no. She sounds nice. Kira beamed. Yes, if my mother could be summed up in one word, it would be nice. Or kind. Or I guess loving, too. David laughed. That's three words. Yes, but they are synonyms so they count as one. David tipped his glass in her direction. Touché, Bugatti. Kira ducked, pleased at the attention and winning the verbal joust. A hot knife of understanding pierced Liam's heart. The relief he'd felt after seeing David could laugh and perhaps would survive Liam's passing was nudged out of the way by a new feeling. One he'd never associated with his brother before, jealousy. Most siblings experienced some sort of rivalry growing up, but not Liam and David. They had been best friends and cheerleaders for one another their whole lives, drawing together as a unit of solidarity in a world of private school competition, baseball, and business. Their unity got them through when others fell apart. If there was anyone in the world Liam could trust with his life or his wife, it was David. And yet, the way David watched Kira move, the way the air crackled between them, their communication without words, made Liam want to build a very tall tower, take Kira to the top, and lock David out. Reaching for Kira's hand, he brought her attention back to him. What did you want to be when you grew up? Kira bit her lip. When I was five, I wanted to be a mermaid. Liam looking her up and down. I can see it. She let her hair fall forward and cover her face. It was silly. I don't even know why I told you that. The servers cleared their plates and replaced them with chocolate gelato. If no one objects, I'm going to eat mine in my room. David picked up the bowl and, bowing to Kira, left the room. Is he always so dramatic? Kira asked, her voice edged with guilt. Yes. Liam swallowed the lump in his throat. And it's wonderful to see. Kira's smile spread, revealing her bottom teeth. It's good to see you out of bed. Alas, I fear I am headed that direction once again. Liam placed his napkin next to his plate. Are you not feeling well? Kira set down her spoon. Just tired. He scooted his chair back and then moved hers. He liked that she let him be a gentleman. By tomorrow morning, I should be bright-eyed and ready to meet the Pope. Kira gasped. We're meeting the Pope? Liam laughed. No. Sorry. I just meant that I should be ready to travel again. Oh. Good. She slipped her hand under his arm and leaned her head against his shoulder. Good? I didn't pack anything to wear to meet the Pope. Liam kissed her hair. You are such a girl. She shrugged, heavy-eyed. But you're my girl, and I'm glad. Me too. Tuck me in? Always. As Kira ran her fingers through his hair, Liam pushed all his jealous notions into the back closet of his mind and slammed the door. Though he hadn't known Kira long, he had a sense about her character. He'd always been able to read people, cutting through the phonies and kiss-ups with surprising speed. Maybe his discernment had been a gift from God, a way to fill his life with honest and good people while he was here. Whatever the reason, he knew he could trust Kira. And David, David was his brother, his best friend. If you couldn't trust a guy like that, then, well, he'd be happy to leave this world for a better one. Chapter 15 Kira's jaw hung from a loose screw as they moved through the halls of the Vatican. Priceless treasures were everywhere, Ev. Re where? Forget about the masterpieces hung in gilded frames, ignore the intricate marble and tile floor, scoff at the hand-painted ceiling if you will, but Kira couldn't pass a globe from the 1500s and not stop to stare at the strange continents, islands, and sea monsters. Seriously, 
Who leaves a globe worth millions of dollars in the middle of the hallway? Kira whispered. Someone who can afford to lose millions of dollars, quipped David. He'd been quiet most of the morning, but the peace from yesterday remained, surrounding his countenance and oozing out in drops like warm caramel. Kira didn't mind him being quiet. It was easier to ignore the way her heart pounded when he was near if he stayed in the background. I'd say it's pretty well protected. Liam nodded to the guard not five feet away, who kept his face straight but whose eyes never left their group. Dressed in the traditional uniform including pantaloons, tights, a doublet, and a feather in his cap, the man looked more like a Shakespearean actor than a threat, that is, until the light glinted off the five-foot spear in his hand. The two-inch thick wood pole holding the spear could do plenty of damage on its own. Which is why Kira kept her hand locked with Liam's. No touching the treasures? No problem. This way. Their private guide, a short woman with bushy red hair and bright lipstick, motioned them towards two large doors. Even though you are here outside of normal hours, we ask that you respect the no-talking rule within the chapel. If you must communicate, please whisper. Kira's first impression was that the room was smaller than she thought it would be. But then, as she beheld the artwork, she realized how very small she felt inside the space. Remembering to whisper wouldn't be a problem. Please do not be touching the walls, said their guide. They drifted apart. David started at the end near the altar, where the depiction of the creation of the world was overhead. Liam went to the other end of the room, following Noah's story and moving backward through the book of Genesis. Kira sat between them on one of the many benches, closed her eyes, and just breathed for a moment, trying to find her place among the greatness. The ceiling prevailed, heavy with plaster and paint blended in such a way that the power of genius pressed in on the viewer. She turned her attention to the walls. The picture of Christ handing keys to Peter was very Romanesque and brought a sense of inevitability and continuity to the soul. The colors were excellent, once again reminding her of sunsets and the sky with blues that heaven worked to match. Christ was the light and center in the picture, his area brightest and the colors darkening the further one stood from him, preaching a sermon and edifying at the same time. Moving on, she studied the next painting, her thoughts between her and God with the ceiling between. David sidled up next to her, his eyes alight with what she now recognized as the architectural side of his being. Do you see the columns that separate the images? He waved his arms to indicate the ceiling. Kira squinted up. They're painted on. They are? She looked harder wondering how paint could be made to look like carved marble. Yep. David shuffled his feet. Some say that the ceiling was never completed. It was supposed to have gold leafing done, and Michelangelo didn't do it. An unfinished masterpiece, Kira whispered. David's eyes fell on Liam at the other end of the room under the creation image. Liam's shoulders drooped. Not unlike man. Excuse me. Kira made her way to Liam and slipped her arm through his. Is it not what you expected, she asked. Do you see how God is stretching to reach Adam, and Adam is kind of lazy about reaching back? Kira craned her neck. Yes. I feel like that. God is calling me home, and I'm not all that happy about heading back. I want to see and do everything this world has to offer. He smiled at her. And I'm not going to make it. Kira laid her head on his shoulder. Why did you want to come here? To gain perspective. Kira's eyes burned. Pointing to the floor, Liam said, this world is just a shadow of God's realm. Where he is, now that's supposed to be something worth seeing. Liam stopped. I wish. I wish I had been a painter and could leave behind a masterpiece like this. That way, no one would ever forget me. Liam, Kira scolded. You're pretty unforgettable. 
Liam chuckled and then grew reflective once again. Kira slipped her arm around his waist and tucked herself against him. He encircled her in his arms. She didn't need to say anything. He just needed her to be there, to feel her next to him, and she was happy to give him exactly what he needed in that moment. Chapter 16 The flight back to the U.S. had been quiet. They watched movies, slept, and ate. After refueling in L.A., they moved on to Las Vegas. Liam blinked against the dry desert sunlight as he stepped off the plane. I feel like I'm going to shed my skin. Kira rubbed lotion into her arms. Like a snake? Liam made a face. Snakes are good for one thing. What's that? Boots. Kira slapped him playfully. You think I'm a snake? No. More like a cute lizard. He pecked a kiss on her cheek, the one place she hadn't slathered with sunscreen. You could be a frog, said David as he passed, his hands full of luggage and a bag over each shoulder. They shed. Kira scrunched her nose. Frogs are slimy. David pointed at her lotion-covered arms. At least I'm not a camel, she teased, nodding to the goatee he'd sculpted this morning. David scowled. Liam held back his laughter. His brother's blonde facial hair did in fact remind him of a camel he'd ridden once. And with him carrying all the bags off the plane. Hey, she could have called you a donkey. Kira shrugged. He's right. I was trying to give a compliment. Camels are exotic. David deposited the bags near the trunk of their town car. The driver, a man with a scar down his cheek and a slight limp, began loading them. I have got to learn to keep my head down around you too. Kira looked around. What are we doing in Vegas anyway? Time to make a childhood wish come true. Liam rubbed his hands together. He didn't have a bucket list. Well, he'd had a bucket list, but he and David had run through it in the first month. Instead, he lived on a whim. This outing was a whim that was more fun than riding camels. Are we going to play with tigers, Siegfried and Roy style? Kiera winked. She knew the duo was no longer performing, but they had a tiger habitat at the Mirage Hotel. With Liam's money and connections, they might just get in. She would love to hold a tiger kitten. Liam held the door and Kira climbed inside. No, Liam slid in next to her. Bungie jump off the space needle, she guessed. No! David climbed in and sat across from Liam and Kira. She narrowed her eyes, considering Liam. You want to sing with Celine Dion? Please no. David covered his ears. Liam can't sing. That's not true. Liam picked up Kira's hand. I can sing, it's just, no one wants to hear it. Kira chuckled. Then where are we going? It's a surprise. Liam kissed the back of her hand. Do you know, she asked David, who was staring out the window. Haven't a clue. You'll just have to wait. Kira clenched his hand. I hate waiting. Liam kissed her head, his heart full of joy. A few minutes later, they pulled into the Silverton Casino and were greeted by several bellhops and the hotel manager. Mr. and Mrs. Bernhard, Mr. Bernhard, it is wonderful to have you here at the Silverton Hotel. He shook their hands. The trunk popped open and their baggage was whisked away to their suite. Liam had asked that they have a space together. They'd have private bedrooms, but he had no desire to be away from Kira and David. Thank you. It's good to be here. The man continued, everything is ready. If you'd like to follow me. They walked into the hotel and paused at the giant fish tank. 
All three of them stepped closer to admire the coral reef with the sunken ship and the hundreds of fish, stingrays, and sharks. We have over 400 fish in the saltwater tank, informed the eager manager. It's beautiful. Kira pressed her hand against the glass. A splash and a giant fin and a wall of bubbles filled their view. When the bubbles cleared, Kira's mouth formed an adorable little O as she took in the mermaid. Yes. Liam did a mental fist pump. The mermaid pressed her hands against the other side of the glass and grinned at Kira. Her blonde hair floated all around her head. She beckoned Kira to come. Kira laughed and tapped the glass. I can't come in. Sorry. The mermaid nodded and beckoned again. Kira stepped back. Would you like to join her? asked Liam. What? Oh, yeah, right. What? You said you wanted to be a mermaid. Kira stared at him. Are you kidding me? A bellhop appeared with a mermaid costume on a hanger. It was blue and purple with giant shells and beads across the bodice. Now's your chance. Liam grinned. Kira squealed and threw her arms around his neck. Liam laughed. Go be a mermaid. Kira let go and bounced a couple of times. This is so cool. A small woman with long blonde hair came out of a hidden door. Hi. I'm Mermaid Ariana. You all set? Yes. Kira bolted after her. She stopped at the door and gave Liam a thumbs up. Liam waved her off and turned to watch the fish in the aquarium. David rubbed his goatee. That was really cool. Liam scratched his head. She was pretty excited. They stared at the fish for a minute, watching a ray float by. Are you, are you falling in love with her? David asked. Liam could see David in the glass. He looked like a ghost with the fish swimming through his reflection. There's no falling. I knew the moment I saw her that I loved her. Love at first sight. David tucked his hands in his pockets. No. You're not understanding. I loved Kira before, I love her now, and I will love her for eternity. David tipped his head, his face growing thoughtful. What? asked Liam. The other day, Kira asked if I believed it was possible to have known someone in heaven, as in, before we were born, and then recognize them here. Liam closed his eyes. He knew what he felt for Kira was beyond the veil of this life, but he wasn't sure if she felt the same. Do you think she meant me? He hoped, harder than he'd hoped to live, that somehow, someway, his connection to her, his feelings for her, weren't one-sided. Who else could she have been talking about? David smiled, though something in his eyes said that he held back a piece of information that didn't fit with what he just said. Liam understood, David had feelings for Kira too. Chapter 17 Kira discovered that wiggling into the costume wasn't as easy as Mermaid Ariana made it look. Instead of having a tail and then a bikini top, the outfit was one solid piece that ran from her toes to her neck and down to her wrists. Using flesh-colored fabric, the designers had created the appearance of skin where shells and fin didn't cover. After an insane amount of grunting and stuffing and tugging, Sweat dripped down her back and she'd made the transformation from woman to mermaid. Flopping like a fish out of water was too much effort, so she lay on the deck, her chest heaving. Mermaid Ariana gave her a beginner's course on how to use the breathing tubes, called hookah ports, at the bottom of the 15-foot pool. And if you ever get nervous, you can just swim back to the top of the tank. Okay. Kira slid onto the swing that would move her out over the water. I saw sharks. She gripped the handles, using her gut to keep her tail out of the water. Exhausting work for such a majestic creature. There are sharks, but they don't bite. 
It's a special breed. Okay. Sure. Sharks that don't bite. Stingrays that don't sting. The option of drowning, what a dream. The swing lowered with a rocking motion. The longer she held her breath, the looser her grip became. Use your arms to stay up and change direction. You mean I have to actually let go? If you want to swim. Oh, how she wanted to swim. And I won't sink? Nope, your fin is an actual fin. Trust me, you'll float in the salt water. Kira moved both hands to one bar. Isn't that what mermaids say right before they pull you under? Ariana grinned. You're not my type. Ha! Ha! Okay, I'm coming in. Kira set her palms on the seat, digging the flesh into the edge, before pushing off. She squealed and stretched her neck to keep her head above water. Ariana swam to the edge, graceful as a swan, and came back with two sets of goggles and nose plugs. These will make it more comfortable to be under for a longer time. If not, the salt can irritate your eyes. Thanks. Kira took a moment to situate her gear. Made of high-grade plastic, the mask was clear and would blend in once underwater, but from up here, Ariana looked alien and she was sure she was just as attractive. I don't want you to worry about who is watching it first. Just get used to being under the water. When you're ready, you can start interacting. Kira took a deep breath and followed Ariana down to a breathing tube. She cleared the mouthpiece of water by pushing the button on the back before taking a deep breath. To her relief, the tube worked fine. Ariana gave her an okay. Sign and Kira returned the gesture to let her know that she felt good. She stayed near the bottom, swimming back and forth as far as her air tube would let her until she felt brave enough to let it go for a moment. Knowing she wasn't far enough down that she couldn't swim to the top in an emergency helped calm her spiking nerves. Taking a deep breath, she did a lap all the way around the aquarium. Feeling good, she explored the coral reef for a moment, running her hand over the rough surface of the shipwreck. How cool is this? She squealed underwater, letting out a barrage of bubbles and diving for a breathing tube. Ariana was right, the fin acted as a propulsion device. Funny how moving like a mermaid didn't take long to figure out. Perhaps this was her destiny. Laughing a face full of bubbles, she delighted in the sense of transformation to the fanciful. Tapping on the glass got her attention, and she turned in that direction to see a pair of girls in pigtails waving. I'm the fish in the bowl. Swimming over, she waved back. They ducked their heads, shy and adorable. She tapped on the glass and they looked up. Smiling, she made a heart with her hands. They copied her gesture. Blowing them a kiss followed by a stream of bubbles, she used the air tube and swam along the glass until she came to a couple. They smiled and waved. She did the heart sign again and pointed to the two of them. They nodded and the guy kissed the woman's cheek. Kira put both hands over her heart and made a pumping motion. The couple laughed. She gathered the fingers of both hands and then touched them together as if they were kissing then pointed at the couple. They laughed and kissed. Kira gave them a thumbs up and moved on, looking for Liam and David. She wasn't sure which side of the tank she'd left them on and the curved glass distorted images. Up ahead, a hand pressed against the glass but the body leaned away. With the curve, she couldn't see who the hand belonged to. Creeping along the bottom, she picked up the breathing tube that was near the hand. After taking a deep breath, she slid her hand along the glass, moving up, until her fin floated lazily beneath her. Smiling, she tapped to get the man's attention. David lifted his head and Kira laughed at the shocked expression on his face. He put his other hand up, and she did the same. His smile widened. He lifted his finger and made a circling motion, telling her to twirl. She did a flip. 
he shook his head and spun his hand again. Rolling her eyes, she did a backflip. Laughing, he shook his head and did the same motion. Using her arms, she twirled like a mermaid princess, showing off her scales. David clapped as she slipped to the bottom to retrieve the air hose. Once she was back in front of him, David kissed his hand and pressed it to the glass. Kira paused, staring at his hand and taking in his smolder, so hot it could make the tank boil. Flirting with David was like sailing into a storm, but she was so caught up in the magic of the moment that Kira pressed her hand against the wall, her heart booming so hard she could make waves. Ariana swam over and pointed at Kira, then pointed up, telling her it was time to surface. Kira made an exaggerated frowny face at David and pointed up. He shook his head, pressing his palm to the glass once more. David made a heart with his hands and put it over his chest. Kira felt like a mermaid caught by a sailor's net, knowing she needed to get away but unable to break free. Ariana took her elbow and pulled her towards the surface where the swing had been submerged, waiting for her to leave behind this underwater dream world. She didn't want to go, but all good things must come to an end. Popping through the surface, Kira took a deep breath and removed her goggles and nose plug. Feeling giddy, she giggled. There's my girl. Liam squatted near the ledge. At the sight of him, warmth flooded Kira. Liam, who had every right to be selfish with every minute, had given her dream priority. His goodness and love shined like a beacon. He was her husband, the type of husband that would make a woman happy forever. She wanted to be that woman. Kira glided to the side of the pool and grabbed on. Hi, hubby. Liam brushed his fingers across her cheekbone. You take to this mermaid thing like it's in your blood. I believe a mermaid lurked inside of you all along. Kira held his hand against her cheek. Thank you for helping me find my inner mermaid. And for being a man that a woman can believe in, trust, and care for without reservation. Love? Quite possibly. Though not like the love she'd envisioned. There weren't fireworks or sparks with Liam, nevertheless, something deep and abiding grew between them. Or maybe it had been there all along and she was just uncovering it. Did you know a kiss from a mermaid can protect a man from death? Liam traced her cheek again. Kira let go of his hand and pulled herself further out of the water so she could rest her elbows on the ledge, water sloshing everywhere. Are you trying to gain my favor, my husband? Batting her eyelashes, Kira hoped he'd play along. Liam laid himself on his stomach and rested his chin on his elbows so they were eye to eye. A mermaid's favor is a treasure beyond description. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be lost. And, it can be dangerous. How so? Kira bobbed forward, getting closer to hear Liam's quiet teasing over the sound of the water echoing off the walls. It is said that one kiss can enslave a man so fully that he would be at the mercy of his captor for the rest of his life. Would you be willing to risk such a fate? All traces of teasing vanished. Liam searched Kira's face, his eyes caressing her lips, sweeping up her cheeks, and locking in her gaze. I. How he managed to sound like a pirate and sexy and all sorts of tempting in one word was beyond Kira. Her soul tingled with the feeling that this was right and she was right where she was supposed to be. Liam was her husband, but he was so much more than that. Call it a revelation, call it a dawning of understanding, call it cosmic lightning, but somehow she understood the connection between them went beyond space and time. Caught up in the greatness of what they were when they were together, Kira slid her hand behind his head and tugged him down. Liam cupped her head with one hand and put his other under her arm, holding her out of the water, his torso hanging over the tank. He pressed his lips to hers and waited, as if he expected her to pull away. But Kira had a different idea of what a mermaid kiss should be, what a kiss between her and Liam should be. 
Kicking once with her tail, she surged up into his embrace, tipping her head to the side and taking the kiss from shallow to deep waters. Liam swam right along with her, his lips hungry, taking and taking, and then suddenly he was giving. Giving love and acceptance and courage and hope, pouring it into her until she overflowed, and then the tide turned once again, and Liam was asking for love, which was by now easy to return. Gasping, Liam pulled back, pressing his forehead to hers. I think. I think I love you, Kira. Kira grabbed his shirt in both hands. I think I've always loved you. Shocked by how easily the words had come out, Kira dropped his shirt and fell back into the pool. Waving her arms, she was able to stay close but out of arm's reach. Liam stared. Kira, please. I know that was a lot, and it's all happening faster than it should. Please. Please don't pull away from me. What we have is different. This is not new love. This is the kind of love people have after fifty years together. He held out his hand. Please don't run away from it. Kira dropped her gaze. Movement from the fish and mermaids caused the surface of the water to bounce and sway. Nothing was clear, and yet everything was crystal clear. Liam was her mission, her destiny in this life. They were meant to find one another. She couldn't turn her back on this any more than she could change the color of her eyes. I don't run, she stated. I swim. She flipped her tail and took his hand. Liam pulled her halfway out of the tank, soaking himself and getting water all over the deck. Swim with me, then. Kira placed her hand on his cheek. I. Laughing, Liam kissed her once and then again. Where are we swimming to next? Liam laughed. I have no idea. I think I have one. Liam lifted one eyebrow. Take me away, my love. Chapter 18 Since their kiss, Liam hadn't been able to let Kira out of his sight for longer than it took for her to change clothes. Knowing she loved him as he loved her filled him up and topped him off with whipped cream and sprinkles. Her light touch to his arm or his chest stoked the fire inside and yet calmed his nerves. After a dinner of steak, because Kira refused to eat lobster so soon after her stint as a mermaid, David took them all to see the Iron Sticks play at Caesar's Palace. The music was amazing, the lighting was incredible, and the whole thing overwhelmed his senses to the point that a blinding pain seared into the back of his cornea. He doubled over, pressing the heel of his hand against his eye. Liam? Liam? Kira pulled his face into the space between her shoulder and cheek, which smelled like peonies. David, we have to go, now. David's arm went around Liam's back, and the other supported his arm as they made their way to the lobby. With the decrease in noise, Liam was able to stand up. Where are your meds? Kira patted his pockets. At the hotel. You didn't bring them? David asked. Liam shook his head. Did you take them today? prodded Kira. Liam made a weak effort at a smile. I was busy. He brushed his fingers across her cheekbone. David, call for the car. We're going back. Kira lifted Liam's arm across her shoulders and did her best to support his weight. David did the same on the other side. They paused their steps, and Kira's arm moved down so that it no longer touched David's. Strange, that with all the pain, Liam noticed the shift. Bothered, but unsure why, he chanced opening his eyes to find David staring at Kira with a longing that pierced his understanding. Closing his eyes again, Liam couldn't get them open to see if Kira returned David's adoring look. Liam wondered if he wasn't sick, would David would back off? Probably, his brother would respect the rings they wore. He could imagine the torture this was for David, and yet he couldn't stop himself from enjoying Kira's attention. If Liam wasn't sick, David would leave. 
The valet arrived with their car, and they were soon on their way back to the hotel. Kira insisted Liam rest his head on her lap, and she ran her fingers through his hair over and over again. She murmured sweet words of encouragement and peppered his cheek and head with kisses. Once they'd made it to the hotel room, Kira sought out his prescriptions and made sure he took the proper doses while he lay across the bed, his button-up shirt, pants, and shoes still on. David sat in a chair, staying out of the way but not leaving. What are you writing? David asked her, his voice as low as the dimmed lights. I'm starting a chart for him. A chart? Each prescription has to be taken at the right time and at regular intervals. I'm going to take that in hand and make sure he gets what he needs when he needs it. Why? Because if he takes them regularly, we might be able to prevent these attacks. And because I think it's part of what I'm supposed to do. She cleared her throat. Good. The chair spring popped as if it had lost its load. I'm going to change. Call me if you need anything. Kira, Liam managed. She was next to him before he finished saying her name. Daring to crack his eyes open, he was relieved to find that the light in the room came from the adjoining bathroom and not the glaring lamps. Yes? Kira hovered above him, her long black hair trailing along the pillow and tempting him like a siren. He managed to tangle his fingers loosely in her tresses, allowing it to slide through his fingers like fine silk. Breathtaking, he whispered. Kira allowed her forehead to touch his ever so lightly, as if she were afraid she'd hurt him. What she didn't understand was that having her here, having a wife to share his burden, having someone to love, gave him strength of heart. Straining, he brushed his lips against hers. Liam, she whispered. Hmm. Sleep, my love. Chapter 19 Kira didn't sleep well. Besides waking Liam every four hours to take his medication, she fretted over the different feelings she had for the two brothers. Liam was her soul mate. He was the sunshine in her world, and had she met him when she was five, she would have spent her life by his side. David stoked the fire in her soul. Like a forge master, he could induce heat, sparks, and slow simmers. He was exciting and solid, terrifying and secure, attractive and off-limits, desire and storm. The battling emotions were as equal in intensity as they were different in form. While her love for Liam was formed along with the foundation of the world, her feelings for David were new, tender, and crushable, though not by her. She lacked the power to trample them underfoot, damage like that would have to come from David. He needed to be the jerk. He needed to break her heart. He needed to treat her as not. Try as she might, Kira couldn't picture David intentionally causing her pain, emotionally or physically. The best plan she could come up with was to be 100% devoted to Liam, to turn her attention, her mind, her training, and her focus to his care. She'd worked with many cancer patients, seen some of them healed and some of them gone. Keeping track was never an option. Working that close, caring about people, she couldn't reduce them to numbers, and she didn't want to know the odds, didn't want to keep a tally like a gunslinger or like some of the doctors did. For her, it was about being in the moment with that patient. Liam's acceptance of his diagnosis was rare. Some people had an elongated perspective, they saw beyond death and into eternal life. She admired him for that, because all she could see at the moment was the end of her husband. And it ticked her off. Going into the bathroom and shutting the door, she pulled out her phone and dialed BMB. This is Tina, how may I help you? Hi, Tina. This is Kira. Is Pamela available? Kira worked to keep herself calm. It was mid-morning in Vegas, and the penthouse was still quiet. I'll check, please hold. 
she plucked at the hem of her shirt while she listened to who you'd be today, her anger growing in tiger-length leaps and bounds. This is Pamela Jones. Kira sat up straight. Hi, Pamela. Hello, Kira. Pamela hesitated. Is everything all right? Kira let out a hollow laugh. That's a loaded question. Is it? Don't play dumb with me, Pamela. You knew Liam was dying, and you set me up. Her voice was harsh against the tile. I knew he was sick. He told me that much when we met. That's why it had to be you. Don't you see? He needs a wife, but he also needs a nurse who understands cancer. Her voice grew soft. You've seen it from both sides, Kira. First with your mom and then with the Cancer Institute. No one who can do for him what you can. Kira leaned her head back against the shower door. She'd already come to that conclusion. I hate it when you sound like you could maybe, in a small way, be right. She sighed. But you know what? What? I never signed on to be a widow. In fact, I think I could sue you for breach of contract, misrepresentation, or, or. Kira waved her hand, unable to come up with a third horrible deed she could drop in Pamela's lap. Kira. Even through the phone, Pamela's voice had a magical quality that could stop the wind billowing through Kira's anger. I had, and still have, a good feeling about this. Kira grabbed onto the towel bar, feeling as if she were back on the plane and it had dipped right. She shook her head, trying to regain her sense of equilibrium. Be that as it may, you owe me one, no, two, no, several favors. Pamela's laugh tinkled over the line. Kira continued, grab a pen, I've got a list. She may not be able to cure cancer, but she was going to make darn sure she and Liam made some memories. Who do you know in Major League Baseball? I have a few contacts. Where are you now? We're in Vegas. Perfect, you're just a hop away from a good friend of mine. What do you have in mind? Kira told her of her plans. Is that all? asked Pamela, as if Kira had asked her to set up a massage appointment. For now. Kira wasn't about to let Pamela off the hook. I will have Tina call you with the details and instructions. We'll do all we can to help. You know, it's hard to hate you when you're this nice. Pamela laughed. Kira, you are a jewel. Believe it or not, I care about you quite a bit. I don't think I can ever forgive myself for what happened with Jack. Please, call again any time. I will. Kira stood up and dusted off her backside. She checked the time. Liam was due for another round of meds in half an hour, so she decided to order room service for the three of them. When it arrived, she signed the bill and shut the door behind the server. David stumbled out of his room, his hair in disarray and his chin scruffy. Kira sucked in a breath. There was no need for a man to look that good. Really, what was the point of handing one person all that? That? Hmm. He gave her a cocky grin. Morning. She turned her back to him and busied herself with checking under plate covers. I ordered you a pancake breakfast. David was suddenly behind her, much too close to ignore. She didn't dare turn around. He placed his right hand on her hip as he leaned around her left side to pick up his plate. Smells delicious. Kira's eyes dropped shut. Yes, you do. David chuckled, the sound vibrating in his chest. I mean, the food smells good. Giving her hip a squeeze, he backed away. Kira picked up two plates, ready to put her plan into action. I'm going to eat with Liam. Sounds like a good idea. To her dismay, he followed her into the room. Setting the plates down on the dresser, 
she squeezed Liam's arm. Liam. Liam? He groaned and rolled onto his side, facing away. She sat behind him, her hand on his shoulder. Aware that David was watching her every move had Kira trying to see it all through his eyes, and she didn't like the wall that seemed to pop up between her and her husband. Liam, it's time to eat. He groaned again and rolled back. Was for breakfast? Kira smiled. Bacon, eggs, and pancakes. K. He scooted to the side, moving with caution, first getting up on an elbow, then extending his arm, and finally allowing her to place some pillows behind him so he could rest against the headboard. She moved to pick up the blanket so she could put a pillow under his knees and he slammed his arms down, pinning the blanket against the bed. What are you doing? I was going to put this pillow under your legs so you're more comfortable. Um, dot. Liam colored. David snickered. Um, what? I'm not wearing pajama bottoms. What? You had them on last night. Liam turned red. I kick them off. Kira rolled her eyes. I'm a nurse. I've seen everything. She went to grab the blanket again. Liam secured it in both fists. You haven't seen my everything. Liam. This time it was her turn to flush. David laughed all the harder. Kira threw the pillow at David. You shut it. You're not helping. I don't want to see his everything either. David threw the pillow back at her. Kira caught it. Fine. Nobody is going to see anybody's anything, and we are going to eat breakfast and pretend this didn't happen. She fought the smile that tugged at her cheeks as she settled onto the bed. David took a bite of his eggs. These are great. Thanks for cooking, Kira. I didn't cook. Kira gave him a quizzical look. David and Liam exchanged a look. Liam explained. My mom used to come home with takeout and say, dinner's ready. We teased her about impersonating a cook. So when one of us orders food, we thank them for cooking dinner. It's kind of a running family joke. Oh, I like it. Kira was touched to be included in family stuff. They ate in silence for a few minutes while Kira studied Liam. You look better this morning. Your color's good. I feel pretty good. Not ready to ride roller coasters, but I don't think I'll have to sleep all day. Kira smiled. I think taking the meds throughout the night helped. That's not going to be a thing now, is it? Kira shrugged. I'm calling your doctor today, and I'll go over things with him. We'll see. If we're better about taking them at regular intervals during the day, we might be able to get away with letting you sleep through the night. Liam took her hand. I like the wee part of that. Kira smiled. She hadn't thought of Liam as a lone ranger, but maybe he was. David stood up, carrying his plate. I'm going to hit the showers. Kira watched him leave before turning back to Liam and catching him watching her watch David. Unsettled that he might have seen something in her face or in her eyes that showed the unbidden wanting she had for David, Kira focused on her plate of half-eaten wheat and oat pancakes. Do you think you feel good enough to go out? Liam made a face. I did the Vegas thing a few months ago. Kira shook her head. No. I have something different in mind. Oh. In fact, it's all planned. We won't need to leave here until about three, so I want you to rest, eat, and rest again until then. Liam lifted one side of his mouth in a grin. You really planned something? I did. For me? For all of us, but mostly for you. What is it? Uh, 
Ah, uh, it's a surprise. Pulling her close, Liam said, you just keep getting better and better. Kira was nervous now, wondering if the things she had planned would be of worth. Don't build it up too much. What are you worried about? That you'll think it a waste of time. She bit her lip. Kira, every moment with you is a gift. Once we married, there was no such thing as wasted time. Kira brightened with his words. She knew Jack had beaten her down, dimmed her inner light with his debilitating verbal abuse, but Liam lit those parts of her again. She didn't realize the extent of the damage until she felt the contrast. Liam, you say the most wonderful things. Tell that to my mother. She would be so proud that I didn't come out a hooligan. Kira caught a note of desperation, something unfinished between mother and son. It was the hole in Liam's armor. Kira laughed. Don't worry, I'll tell her. Liam's face had started to drag downward. I think you had better get some sleep. Kiss me goodnight? You don't have to ask, I was already planning on it. They exchanged a slow, lingering kiss. After seeing him settled, she wandered out to the common room, where she found David, showered and crisp, his camel goatee gone, lounging on the couch. She set the breakfast plates on the cart and pushed the cart into the hallway, where she put out the do not disturb sign. David came into the kitchen and grabbed a soda out of the fridge. How is he, really? Well, the last time this happened, he lost a whole day. This time, I think he will be up and ready to go by three, if not before. David brushed his fingers up the back of her arm, sending thrills and chills through her skin. I'm glad he has you. Are you? Kira wondered. For just a moment, as she stared at his lips, she wondered what kissing David would feel like. If the butterflies in her tummy were any indication, it would be a thrilling and most likely overwhelming experience. Perhaps reading her mind, David stepped closer, both hands leaving trails of desire up the back of her arms. Frightened by his absolute interest and her body's tingling reaction to him, she trembled. I need to make a call. She fished her phone out of her back pocket with quaking fingers. David moved backward, drawing out his departure, tantalizing Kira with the thought that he might snap back in at any moment and snatch her up in his arms. A place she wanted to be but shouldn't go, or shouldn't want to be, or shouldn't even think about setting up a permanent settlement. I'll be in the other room. Okay, she sighed as he settled onto the couch and picked up the remote. And I'll be in here remembering how to breathe. She gulped in air, needing one of those masks from the plane that dropped down when the cabin pressure changed. Stupid high-class hotel didn't come with an oxygen tank. Deciding that staying as far away from David as possible was a good idea for the time being, Kira leaned against the cold, stainless steel door of the refrigerator and stared at her phone. Feeling confused and homesick, she dialed her mom. Hi, sweetheart. Hi, mom. How are things? As good as can be expected. Kira crossed to her private room and shut the door, then proceeded to unload the whole situation. Sentences came out in broken fragments. For two years, Kira had held back her stress and worry over bills and chemo in an effort to protect her mom, who was battling the deadly disease. The retaining wall had also blocked her mother emotionally, and bringing her back into her life was a salve. This won't be easy to see through to the end honey. I know. But I can't leave. He needs me. Pause. How are you? Good. I'm sending you a picture of the mirror I found. It's amazing. Kira's phone dinged, and she pulled it away from her ear to check out the picture. Oh, it's so pretty. You would have loved the place we stayed while we were in Italy, Mom. The furniture was incredible. I'll send you some pictures in a few minutes. Sounds good. 
What can I do to help? Kira blew hair off her face. Pray for me and Liam and David. David's the brother? Yes. He's. She wasn't sure how to describe him. He could use a few prayers. I'm on it. Love you. Bye. Chapter 20 Liam stumbled to the bathroom, thankful that his head no longer pounded. Between Kira's ministrations, sleep, and a few kisses, he had come back from this attack faster than the other times. The clock said one in the afternoon. Kira was so good for him and good to him. He opened his bedroom door and found David and Kira on the couch, an angel's game on the big screen. Kira's head was on one end of the couch and her feet were in David's lap and she was sound asleep. She'd been the one to wake Liam up throughout the night, she must have been tired. But seeing David casually touching his bride, even if it was just her feet, brought up that feeling of jealousy again. Liam didn't like it. He wanted Kira all to himself, just for a while. To get that, he'd have to send David away. The idea was unfathomable. David was the one person who had been there for him through everything. He couldn't ask him to leave. So he swallowed the bitter pill and ignored the monsters. Hey, he said as he took the recliner next to David. How long has she been out? About twenty minutes. At the sound of their voices, Kira stirred, stretched, looked at David, and pulled her feet back like he'd slapped them. Sitting up, she hugged the arm of the couch and scowled his direction. David held up his hands. You were the one kicking me. She harumphed and combed her hair off her face, catching sight of Liam. You're up. Yep. And how do you feel? Ready for an adventure. Kira grinned. Great. Get showered and we can leave. It's early. That's okay. We can stop for a late lunch on the way. Anything for my bride, he said, knowing it sounded cheesy but wanting to make sure David knew Kira belonged to him. I can't believe you did this. Liam stood on the first base side of the field, a St. George Redrocks hat on his head and a mitt in his hand. I know it's not the Red Sox or the Yankees, but this is the first game of the Redrocks' first season and you're about to throw out the first pitch. Kira bounced. Pamela had come through with this connection. St. George wasn't a huge town, and the stadium was small, but every seat was full on opening day. You're making history. Liam wrapped her in his arms. I can't believe you did this, he repeated. It's no Sistine Chapel, but I hope you like it. I love it. Liam kissed her quick. And I love you. Court Richmond, the Red Rock's owner, approached. He wore a pale blue button-up shirt with the team mascot on the left pocket, a ball cap, and a billion-dollar smile. He offered his hand to Liam, who pumped it like he was hoping for water. It's good to have you here today. If you folks will follow me out to the pitcher's mound, we'll get started. Amber from the Iron Sticks sang the national anthem a cappella, never missing a note. Some people were born with talent, while Liam's talent was envying them. Her heartfelt rendition brought tears to his eyes. He'd been to hundreds of major league games over the years in private boxes with bigwigs. He'd met players, attended fundraising camps, and loved this sport his whole life, but he never thought he'd get to do something so cool. You sure you can throw that far, teased David. Liam grinned. Nope. He'd done some warm-up throws with the bullpen catcher, and they were pretty weak. He didn't care. God, I'm going to do my best here, please don't let me embarrass myself. Mr. Richmond tapped the microphone once before saying, take me out to the ball game. The crowd cheered. Welcome to Red Rock Stadium. Another cheer went up. We have a special treat for you today. 
In honor of our first game, we're donating 10% of concession sales to the Huntsman Cancer Institute to help fund research and offer relief to families struggling to pay for cancer treatments. Kira's hand flew to her mouth. Liam raised an eyebrow in question. Pamela Jones, she said over the noise from the stands. And now, to throw out the inaugural pitch, Liam Bernhard. Mr. Richmond took Liam's place next to Kira while Liam made his way onto the mound. He scratched his foot in the dirt. Thank you for being discreet. And thank you for the donation. Kira wiped at a stray tear. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. They quieted down as Liam rolled the ball around in his hand. He let out a deep breath, moved into a wind-up, kicked out his leg, and let the ball fly. Had there been an umpire behind the plate, he would have called it a ball, but Liam had gone the distance. Throwing her arms in the air, Kira let out a whoop and joined him on the mound. He pulled her in for a kiss before following their guide off the field so the game could start. We have a place for you in the owner's box, said Mr. Richmond. Liam looked at the crowd in the stands. The place was packed for opening day. Salesmen in bright green t-shirts called out their wares. Popcorn. Cracker Jacks. Cotton candy. Soda. Beer. Money was passed down the row, and food was passed back to the buyer. Behind the stadium towered red hills, carved and smoothed over by the wind. The Red Rocks had shelled out some major dough to sign big-name all-stars, and the Phillies were in town. I think I'd like to watch from down here, if that's okay. You bet. I'll take you to your seats. They were escorted to the first row behind the Red Rocks dugout. Kira went in first, then Liam and David followed. They ate popcorn, booed the ump's bad call, and watched Joe Lemke Jr. hit his first home run of the season. This is a great day. At his praise, Kira glowed. Such little things, these words we use, with such a big impact. Kira was sensitive to them. He wondered, not for the first time, what her ex-husband had done to damage her. She was a tough woman who had taken on widowhood with grace and understanding, and yet her tenderness shone through. He couldn't understand her ability to let him go. If the roles were reversed and she had cancer, he would shut down, hide away from the world, and be more like David had been. Kira deserved more, she deserved better than he could give. She deserved to have all her dreams come true, and he vowed to find a way to make it happen. Chapter 21 What are we doing here? You'll see. Kira linked her arm through Liam's and led him into Iron Mountain Lodge. They'd stayed in Vegas for a short time, making sure Liam was well rested before moving on to their next adventure. The guys seemed content to let Kira take the lead, so she made another phone call to Pamela, who got her in touch with a couple who owned the Iron Mountain Ski Resort in Park City, Utah. RYM had wavy brown hair that hung past his chin and a groomed beard. He smiled easily and took every opportunity to adore his wife, Amber. Amber carried herself with an air of efficiency. All it took to get a private day on the mountain was the mention of Pamela Jones. Amber arranged the transportation from the airport, a beautiful meal on the resort's long deck, and rooms for the three of them that night. Kira had been hesitant to discuss their situation, not sure how much to reveal until Amber asked. Is this your first BMB marriage? No, it's my second. RYM was my fourth. But he was worth waiting for. Kira rubbed her palms on her jeans. I didn't expect to fall in love with him. Amber, though dressed in designer clothing and wearing shoes Trish would envy, fit with the rugged beauty of the lodge. Great timbers supported the vaulted ceiling, and ornate rugs dotted the floor. A light path, worn into the wood floor by thousands of people over dozens of years, went from the front entrance to the back deck. Just off the deck was a large grassy area with beach chairs and a ski lift that ran today at Kira's special request. 
When Amber and RYM learned of the situation, they'd refused Kira's credit card. Call if you need anything. Amber gave her a one-armed hug. Kira thanked her and moved outside to where Liam and David waited. It's not really ski season, David grumbled. No, it's not. It's better. Kira smiled. Better how? asked David. They loaded onto the empty lift. Today was just for the three of them. The motor made plenty of noise, the rollers clanged together, but the mountain was quiet. Huge pine trees and aspens lined the right side of the lift, and a carpet of grass and wildflowers was laid out on their left. It's better because it's cloud season. Is that why you made me wear this garbage bag? asked Liam. It's not a garbage bag, it's a rain poncho, and yes, you're going to want it. The lift took them far up the mountain, leaving the lodge to look like a pebble in the distance. Liam grabbed her hand. Look. He pointed into a tree. Kira squinted at the lump, and two dark eyes gazed back. Is that a porcupine? I think so. They exchanged a delighted laugh. Over there. David pointed off to a group of boulders where two chipmunks bounced around like popcorn popping. Kira leaned back in the seat and took a deep breath of clean mountain air full of depth and moisture. She wished she could drag her feet along the hiking path they'd crossed several times, but doubted Liam had the stamina for such a climb. The lift hustled along and soon they were at the top, where an older woman with silver hair said hello. This way. She walked along in front of them, pointing out the different runs. They look so different in the spring, said David as they went up and over the top of the mountain. Below them lay a sea of white and gray clouds. The surface was full of bumps and ridges, and it stretched on as far as they eye could see. Oh, you've skied here, asked Kira, worried she wasn't giving Liam a new experience. Many times. Dad was good friends with the previous owner, answered Liam. Kira's heart sank. She'd hoped this would be new to Liam like it was to her, an experience they could have together. Wonderful. Then you've probably been here in a snowstorm, which is an amazing experience, said their guide. Utah has the best snow on earth, agreed Liam. Kira squeezed his hand, sure that if anyone had tested all the mountains in all the world for ski conditions, it would be Liam. You've never been here in the spring? Nope. Liam shook his head. Kira felt the tension in her chest release. She hadn't realized the anxiety she had concerning today's adventure. Planning outings, though fun, carried a weight she hadn't anticipated. Their guide nodded. Well, today we're going to give you a new way to get down the mountain. They moved into a cluster of trees and soon came upon a platform constructed of heavy timbers. Above the platform towered a zip line, with hooks just waiting for them to strap into. Zip lines have become quite popular all over the world as a way to see and experience nature without tromping through it, and Utah is finally getting on board. The woman handed out harnesses and walked them through how to step inside and tighten the straps. No, not like that. Their guide reached behind David and yanked on a loop, making him jump away. Hey! His face turned red. Kira and Liam laughed. David shook out his right leg, pulled his pant leg down, and scowled. They climbed five steps and hung back from the jumping-off point. Who's first? David and Liam exchanged a look. David's afraid of heights, tattled Liam. Liam's scared spitless of spiders, countered David. They glared, daring the other to say something else. The tension between the men held more than just the zipline argument, and it didn't escape Kira. Yes, she had feelings for David and sensed that he could also feel the attraction that built between them with each look, but until this moment, he had remained the gentleman. Angry, she huffed, boys. Stomping to the stairs, she said, I'll go first. Before she made it up the first step, 
she was caught, one brother holding each arm. Liam shook his head, I'll go first, doesn't matter if the line snaps on me. It does. Kira held his gaze. It matters. Liam lifted his cheek in a rakish smile. Good to know. His thumb brushed back and forth over her arm, sending shivers over her skin. Having been caught up in the moment, Kira was surprised to hear David say, See ya, at the bottom, as he was hooked in. When did he let go of my arm? You two can go at the same time, the guide said. David made eye contact with Kira for one supercharged moment before kicking his feet into the air and flying off into the clouds. Ever the gentleman. Kira stared at the zip line. She could hear David sliding away and feel it even stronger. Being with Liam was the right thing to do, it's what she wanted to do, but in doing so, she was losing David. As much as she hated to think about a time when Liam wouldn't be around, she couldn't help but worry about being alone once again. Where being alone had been a good thing after Jack, she now understood the magnitude of that word, and she dreaded returning to a state of unlove, where the absence of another person meant emptiness and quiet and hollow moments. Are you ready to touch the clouds? asked their guide. As I'll ever be. Liam grinned. Kira gave him a weak smile in return, even she could feel the lack of enthusiasm. Brushing away her thoughts of what would happen when wasn't working. I'm ready. I'm so not ready. With a one two three, they pushed off from the platform at the same time. Picking up speed, they slipped into the clouds, where they entered a different world. Wisps of white floated by, and all she could see was a wall of grey in every direction. It never came closer, nor did it move farther away. Kira's sense of direction came from the wind running chilled fingers across her cheeks, arms, and legs. Liam, she called out, her throat tight. I'm here, came his sweet reply. His voice was all around her, bouncing off moisture droplets and coming from every direction at once. I can't see you. Swinging her legs, she twisted to see to her right. Doesn't mean I'm not nearby, loving you. Kira yearned to hold his hand, to feel the solidness of him against her skin. Liam, stay close to me. Always. Kira hugged her arms to her chest, a sense of calm encircling her heart. Liam would be with her, always, because she'd never stop loving him. There were a few moments of quiet and clouds, and then the valley opened up below them. Green and blue and beautiful, the sight made hope soar in Kira's chest. A reservoir spread out like a mirror on their left, and the city of Midway, with small houses and large hay fields, bowed at their feet. The overcast sky broke apart, allowing the sun to warm their skin. Liam tipped his head up to the light and threw out his arms, flying and floating and serene. Hot tears pressed from Kira's lashes to her hairline, driven off her face with the stiff breeze. She had been so excited about this trip, about the opportunity to give Liam something he didn't have, the chance to touch a cloud. Instead, all she'd done was remind herself of everything she was about to lose. Tears streamed down her face. She hoped Liam couldn't see them from his wire and wiped furiously as they neared the bottom. You okay? he called. Yep. She swallowed the lump in her throat to clear her voice. The wind made my eyes water. That was amazing. Liam flashed her a smile as he came to a stop. The attendant unhooked his harness, and Liam's smile faltered. He fell forward, landing on his hands and his knees. Kira cried out, thrashing against her harness. David rushed over. Get me out, she called to the worker, who stared at Liam like he was demented. Kicking her feet and clawing at the harness frightened the teen even more. Perhaps it was the hysteria in her voice that got him moving, because he jolted into action. In an instant, she was on her knees next to Liam. Can you move? Maybe, he replied. 
With a little help, he turned over and settled on his backside, leaning against David. Sweat beaded on his upper lip, and he breathed hard. Hands shaking, he wiped his brow. I think it's time to go to the cabin. David's face contorted. His eyes drifted shut, and the life and laughter Kira had come to associate with David oozed away. What cabin? she asked. Liam placed his hand on her forearm. A resting place. Are you sure? David stared up at the mountain, seemingly unable to face Liam, or face Liam's words, or face what this would do to him. Liam grimaced. I have pains that don't stop. Pains? David clarified. Liam nodded. Kira shook her head so fast her hair whipped her cheek. A resting place? As in the resting place? She looked at David, begging him to tell her that she'd misunderstood. She was doing everything, everything the doctors asked. They should have more time, she should have more time. Liam continued, his eyes full of apology. This time with you has completed my life. I'm ready to rest now. Her cheeks, dry a moment ago, were wet with grief. Liam might be ready, but she wasn't anywhere close. Three months, he told her he had three months, and they'd shared one. Liam moved to stand and she and David were there, side by side, to help him to his feet. They understood one another's movements, knowing where to fill in where the other left off. Together, they were the whole of what Liam needed. Kira couldn't seem to find the handle to turn off the faucet and continued to cry. This is what you agreed to, she reminded herself. Liam brushed her cheek. I'm sorry. I can't seem to stop. Kira swiped at the other side. I'm so stupid. Hey! Both Liam and David snapped. David's jaw hardened and he clamped his mouth shut, looking away. Liam pulled her close. His calm amid Kira's storm was an open door to the flood of self-decimation. I am stupid. I threw you down a mountain on a wire, and you're in pain. I should never have planned this dumb trip. I'm a nurse, I should know better. What an idiot. She sniffed loudly and unladylike and then hated herself for that too. Kira. I'm thrilled you planned this trip. When we hit the clouds and you called out for me, I realized that I'm not leaving, not for good. We are linked by our marriage now, but something far greater holds us together, my heavenly friend. He brushed her hair over her shoulder. If only you could see your soul, Kira, you shine like the sun. Kira smiled through the tears. My soul? Liam glanced down, hesitant. For a couple of days, when I look at people, I can see this outline or glow. On some it's dingy, but yours. Yours is a beacon. I even saw you through the clouds. Oh, Liam. Kira wrapped her arms around his neck and pressed her lips to his. Liam's strength seemed to return and he stood straighter, fitting her against his frame. For just that one moment, Kira sensed a part of him a part of his eternal spirit, reach out and erase Jack's influence from her life. Like taking off a lampshade, the brightness underneath burst forth, and she gasped, breaking the kiss. How? She pressed her fingers to her lips. I don't know. Liam smiled, cupping her cheek. The sound of an approaching vehicle snagged Kira's attention. The car's here. She snuggled into that spot under his chin. Can we just stay right here, forever? We can stay as long as you like. Liam rubbed circles on her back. After a moment, Kira could feel his legs quaking and knew he'd given her his all. I'll bet Ella has dinner waiting, said Kira, giving Liam an excuse to find rest. Are you hungry? Yes, she answered, though she didn't think food would ever taste good again. Chapter 22 
The plane ride from Salt Lake City to Jackson Hole was just under an hour. Once they landed, Ella took a car ahead of them. She'd spent the time on the plane coordinating with doctors and the private hospice company Liam selected six months ago. Kira asked questions that Ella relayed to the doctors, taking notes that Kira said she would look over later. Kira melted into her role as nurse, but Liam was thankful she didn't let go of his hand. The house is already stocked with medical supplies, it's just a matter of getting the right personnel in place, Ella explained before she bolted off the plane and into a waiting car. She wanted to get to the cabin and check things over before they arrived. Liam had bought Ella an island, complete with a hammock on the beach and a young and handsome masseuse. She didn't know about her gift and wouldn't until he passed. Liam moved slower down the stairs than his ever-energetic assistant. The pain was a factor, but he noticed that it took a greater amount of concentration to walk. The thought terrified him. He wasn't afraid to die, he was worried about the dying process. Still, the medication Kira injected had taken effect, and he was able to support his own weight. Kira tucked her arm under his and stayed close to his side. He marveled at her womanly ability to hold him up while appearing to lean on him. David had been silent since the zip line, staring out the window. He too hung close, but it came at a cost. Liam wasn't sure what upset David more, going to the cabin or the kiss he'd witnessed. You'll have to fight over color, said Liam, gesturing to the shiny new Lamborghinis waiting in side-by-side -side parking spots. I don't understand. Kira shook her head. I bought you and David cars. Since we'll be staying in town for a while, I wanted you both to have a way to get about without having to rely on drivers, or anyone for that matter. Freedom is precious. What he provided was a way for them to escape what was coming if needed. He wouldn't force them to remain at his side, love demanded was not love at all. Kira had been with him and David non-stop for a month. She was an independent woman who was used to taking care of others and never taking care of herself. That needed to change, and this car was the first step in that direction. Thank you. That's very kind. Which one do you want, Kira, asked David. Kira considered the two. Which one looks more bad, eh? David and Liam chuckled. Some of the impending doom that had enveloped them in Park City unfolded, reminding them all to cherish this moment while still dreading the one to come. I think the red one, replied David. Then you'd better take that one. I'll take the white. Are you sure? David was already walking towards the apple-colored vehicle. Yep. Kira opened her door and settled behind the wheel. She ran her hands over the leather steering wheel cover and took a deep breath of that new car smell. Liam climbed into the passenger seat. I'm glad you picked the white. Why? It's the color angels wear, and you are most definitely my angel. I wish I was an angel, angels can work miracles. You already have. Liam kissed her hand and then allowed her to slip away to grab the wheel. That one movement summarized their marriage in a bittersweet picture, making it difficult for Liam to fight off melancholy once again. How quickly depression could overshadow his life. Lord, I need some help to get through this. Being sad was not the way to spend your final days, at least, that wasn't how Liam wanted to spend them. The engine roared to life, and Kira blinked. How much did this cost? Why? Because it sounds expensive. She held up both hands. Wait, I don't want to know, she said in warning. Liam grinned. Why not? Because if I know, I will treat it like a NICU baby. If I don't know, I'll feel free to rev the engine. Hey, Bugatti, David called through his open window. Try to keep up. Kira slammed her door shut. Hang on, she told Liam as she shifted into drive and floored the accelerator. 
The tires squealed and they shot forward. Whoop! Kira shifted into second and then third without hesitation. It's been a few years since I drove a stick, she called over the engine. It's like riding a bike. Liam cursed and grabbed the door handle. It's a very expensive car, he yelled, trying to slow her down as she edged next to David's bumper in an attempt to pass. Kira tipped her chin and laughed, a deep, throaty laugh full of joy that punched through to Liam's core. Delighted, Liam joined her. Kira let up on the gas so she didn't hit the back of David's car as he slowed for a turn she would have taken at full speed. This vehicle could hug the curves like an excited 21-year-old. David surged forward and she did the same, tailing him through downtown Jackson at a respectable speed and up into the hills where private estates and iron gates dotted the hillside. Not that Kira saw any of them. All she focused on was the road, the wheel, and the gas. In 100 feet, your destination will be on the right, came a voice over the speakers. Liam offered a prayer of gratitude right out loud. They pulled into a circular driveway lined with cement curbing. Setting the parking brake, Kira looked through the windshield and beheld an architectural masterpiece. David jumped from his car and ran over to yank open Liam's door. You're a jerk, man. His words sounded angry, but his smile contradicted them with force. Liam offered a hand, and David pulled him all the way up to his feet and into his arms, where he proceeded to pound him on the back. Kira cringed, looking for a way to stop the exuberant hug. I can't believe you did this. Did what? Kira stood with the door open, one foot still in the car. He built my cabin. David threw his arm out to indicate the two-story log structure with windows the size of hotel rooms and a front door big enough for a beanstalk and a giant. Your cabin? Liam prodded David towards the front door. David drew the plans for this cabin a couple years ago. The sun disappeared. In response, outdoor lighting came on, bathing the flower beds and pathways in buttery light. Torches on either side of the door sputtered to life. David sprinted inside. It's beautiful. This is our home. It's exquisite, Liam agreed. From out here, anyway. I haven't been inside yet. Then how did you pick carpet and cabinets and stuff? He shrugged. I had a designer do all that. Oh. They walked through the huge double doors to find a distressed wood floor covered in a red shag carpet. Kira kicked off her shoes and sank her toes into the soft fibers. David careened around a corner, his messenger bag banging away as he ran. He picked Kira up around her middle and spun in a circle. Kira smiled down at him, caught up in his joy and happy to show Liam how happy he made them all. I guess you have to call yourself an architect now. Kira smacked David's shoulder. David set her down and grabbed Liam. Thank you. David sprinted off again, a child in his playhouse. Kira snuggled next to Liam. He felt. Content. You've given him a piece of himself. She met his gaze. Is he your masterpiece? Are you finishing him? He's part of it. Liam didn't expound, and Kira didn't pressure him. A man needed some space to figure things out. When he was ready to talk, she'd be there. She planned to be here until the very end, and shored herself for the task ahead. The chef had protested Kira stepping in to wash dishes after dinner. Granted, he'd protested while hanging his apron in the pantry, so Kira didn't take him too seriously. Liam lounged in the couch across the room in the bay window. He had the television on, watching the Red Sox play the Red Rocks, the sound turned low. She'd noticed the change in his pace, yet hadn't brought it up. A sense of stalling the inevitable permeated the house, and Kira hesitated to shoo it away. Hey, Bugatti. 
David tugged her hair before grabbing a towel and drying the dishes stacked on the counter. Don't call me that. Kira glowered. He had no right to grab her as he had earlier, and his assumed familiarity in her personal space now irked her. Why not? I looked it up, that car is top of the line and over the top. So are you. David tapped her nose. Turning back to the sink, she muttered, not like that. David set aside the dish he was drying. Exactly like that. More than that. Kira, you are a top-of-the-line woman. Thank you for saying so. She set a pot in the suds and went to work. Why don't you believe it? Kira sighed. I'm working on it. Liam had healed all the puncture wounds Jack had made in her soul. All of them. Not one was left. Still, she had some retraining to do. Had to find a way to see herself again. With Liam around, seeing beauty wasn't difficult. Kira, you have two men who love you. David. Her head whipped to the side to make sure Liam hadn't heard. He hadn't turned and watched the screen as if he couldn't hear them. Don't say that. David placed his hand on her lower back and leaned in, bringing the designer cologne smell front and center in her attention. I can't help it. I know he's my brother, and my loyalty to him is strong, but I can't help the way I feel about you. He dropped his hand. And don't think that it's not ripping me apart knowing that it's Liam you are free to love, to kiss. I don't understand what's happening between us or why, but I can't pretend it's not there. Kira shifted, putting space between them. Even having this conversation was crossing a line. Although, drawing some lines would be a good thing. Without activities to distract them, lounging around the house could become awkward. And the last thing she wanted Liam to worry about was competition. She would do all she could to make sure he knew he was her one and only. Fine, we don't pretend, but that doesn't mean we have to act on it. You're right. You're absolutely right. David pushed away from the counter. I'm going for a drive. Kira closed her eyes, hating that she had to push him away but not seeing another path. How could she uphold her vows and hold on to David? The two ideas were exact opposites. She refused to discuss a future with David that didn't have Liam in it. Those thoughts were as traitorous as giving in to her desires. For the three of them, time stopped when Liam passed. Anything that came after that would have to evolve. She would not look forward to a day when she wasn't a married woman. Jackson Kimber, the Red Rock star pitcher, threw a sinker that had the announcer singing his praises, but Liam didn't care to watch the replay. Instead, he watched the reflection of Kira doing dishes in the kitchen. He listened to the clinks, the water slosh, and her feet shuffle against the tile. He'd watched David come in and dry. The two looked domestic. Like they belonged together. They should be together. David could give Kira a home. PFT, he could design and build a home for her. And David could give her children. Liam enjoyed kissing Kira, and he relished the feel of her body next to his, but he was physically unable to take the relationship further. Which was somehow fine. The noble thing to do would be to give them his blessing and send them to a tropical paradise. Perhaps, four months ago, he would have been strong enough to do that. But now, the fear had crept in, and his bravado evaporated like morning fog on the west coast. He needed Kira, needed her enough that he was desperate to keep her around. Standing, Liam smiled at Kira. I'm just going to take a break. I'll be back. She waved with a soap-covered hand and a soft smile. Liam made his way to the closest bathroom, shut the toilet lid, and sat down. Taking a deep breath, he fished his phone out of his pocket and switched the camera to selfie mode. 
hitting record, he started the movie. Kira and David, I pray you'll both forgive me in time, but I'm about to do something incredibly selfish. Chapter 23 The next morning, Kira set out three plates of waffles, her grandmother's wheat recipe, which never failed to please, and went in search of Liam and David. Those boys could eat like teenagers, and she enjoyed making them breakfast in her kitchen. Having a home was an amazing feeling. Not that her name was on anything, but knowing that it belonged to Liam, and Liam belonged to her was. Enriching. She looked for David first, hoping to pop in and out on her way to Liam's room. Knocking on the open door, she called, breakfast. David didn't reply, and she wondered if he slept through his morning run. Deciding to chance a peek, she pushed the door open until she could see the crisply made bed. Leaning through the arch, she checked the bathroom and found it dark. Strange. The room had a sense of abandonment, and Kira fought a sense of dread as she hurried to Liam's room. She found him in a chair by the window, staring at the huge pine trees. Breakfast is ready, but I can't find David. Liam continued to stare. He left this morning. His voice was flat. Relieved that Liam knew his whereabouts, Kira turned to go. I'll put them in the warmer for him. He'll be gone a while. Liam dropped his arm. Kira's blood chilled, making it impossible to move. How long? Liam shrugged. He didn't say. Kira crackled with guilt. If she had never flirted with David in that mermaid tank. Kneeling next to the chair, she took Liam's hand. I'm so sorry. He should be here with you, not me. I want you. Liam brushed a tear off her cheek. But he's your brother. And you are my wife. Still, Kira couldn't shake the feeling that she'd come between the brothers. The doorbell rang, and she got to her feet. That will be the doctor's. Liam shrunk into his chair. Come on, you big baby, I'll hold your hand. Liam took her outstretched hand and she pulled him up. Baby? You're the one crying. Okay, I'll stop if you promise not to start. Deal. Several hours and exams later, Liam took an afternoon nap, and Kira sat down to talk to Drs. Scott and Washington. Dr. Scott was older with a thick head of hair, and Dr. Washington was younger and completely bald. She'd worked with both doctors at the Cancer Institute and could imagine what they charged to make the house call. The next couple of weeks will be the hardest as he loses control of his limbs. Kira pressed her fingers to the bridge of her nose. I'm impressed with his stamina. Not many at this stage would have his energy. Is there anything we can do? Kira pled with them. On a clinical level, she was informed and prepared, on an emotional level, she was a mess. Not without his consent. Radiation isn't an option because of the tumor's location, neither is surgery. Chemo. At this stage. I know. Kira held up her palms, unable to hear any more. Now, I don't want you administering medication, taking his vitals, or doing work. Your job as nurse is over, and there will be round-the-clock care for him from this time on. Just focus on being with him while you can. Dr. Washington patted her shoulder. It was good advice. The trouble was, without her nurse's role, all she had left was her love for Liam and the heartache of letting him go. Later that night, Kira and Liam settled into the overstuffed leather couch to watch a movie. Liam picked, so they watched Sandlot with the Screaming Boys, Baseball Eating Dogs, and Mischief. About halfway through, Liam kissed her hair. You know what I love? What's that? I love that even though I'm the sick one and you're the nurse, you still want me to put my arm around you. Kira brushed her fingers through his hair. You'll always be my husband first. 
Liam's gaze traveled lazily down to her lips. Kira, anticipating his desire, leaned in, and when their lips met, she melted into his tenderness. Liam took his time, moving slowly and thoroughly over her mouth, building the intensity. Kira reacted to his skill and softness, arching into him. Moving to her neck, Liam left a trail of heat from her shoulder to her lips and back again. Tuck me in, he growled into the soft spot behind her ear. Kira giggled. Right here. He pulled back. I want to fall asleep with you in my arms. There was no question. Of course. She pulled a fuzzy blanket off the top of the couch and laid it over both of them. Liam leaned against the armrest, and Kira slid one arm between his back and the couch cushion and laid her head on his chest. Is this okay? She hoped her weight wasn't too much for him. It's perfect. They watched Squint's fake drowning for a kiss from the beautiful lifeguard, and slowly, they relaxed into the couch and drifted off. Sometime in the night, Kira awoke to a bright blue screen. She got up to turn the TV off, not sure where the remote ended up, and Liam shifted on the couch. Instead of moving him so she could rejoin him, she repositioned the blanket to cover his feet and curled up in the recliner. David may have left Liam, but she wouldn't. Chapter 24 Kira puttered around the house while Liam slept for most of the next day. He woke up around dinner time and was able to eat some chicken and salad before going back to sleep on the couch. The nurses took turns giving him shots, most of which he slept through. Worried that they were over-medicating him, she called his doctor. Does he look like he's fighting to come out of it? asked Dr. Washington. No, he's peaceful. What about when he did wake up, was it a struggle? Was he groggy? No, Kira's shoulders slumped. I think we're fine, but I'll come up first thing in the morning to check on him. Thank you. Kira hung up the phone and hung her head. She settled on the floor next to the couch and held Liam's hand while she watched Sleepless in Seattle. When her legs were asleep, she made a bed on the floor and slept. True to his word, Dr. Washington was at their door at seven in the morning. Kira leaned over and kissed Liam on the forehead to wake him up. To her relief, his eyes fluttered open. He smiled up at her. Your hair sighting. Kira's hand flew to her head. It felt like a giant bird nest. Laughing, he allowed the nurse to help him sit up. You're Lil Beautiful, R.A. Liam kissed her hand. What? Kira asked. You're beautiful. Liam scowled. You are B-U-T-I-F-L, he said, much slower. Dr. Washington leaned forward. How long has his speech been impaired? This is the first time I've noticed it. Me too. Liam gripped Kira's knee, a frightened look on his face. The doctor held out his hands and asked Liam to squeeze them at the same time. You're weaker on the right side. He released Liam and took off his glasses. I'm afraid the tumor may have grown. We can do scans. No, Liam looked up. I, no, knew. Dis hap. No. Sean's. Kira bit her cheek to fight off the tears that sprung forth at Liam's bravery. He submitted with a grace that defied understanding, while Kira kicked like a petulant child. Okay. Dr. Washington patted Liam's knee. You okay? Liam shrugged. I'll see myself out. Please call any time. Kira sat by Liam. Are you hungry? He shook his head. Do you want to go for a walk? No. I sleep. Liam. Kira put both hands on his cheeks. I'm sorry. This has got to be so frustrating for you. Not. You. 
fault. Liam kissed her, his lips pulling to the left. Well, you're still a great kisser. Liam smiled. You. Great. Wife. She tucked him in and played with his hair until he fell asleep. When his breathing was even and his face peaceful, she went into the bathroom, turned on the faucet to block out noise, and crumpled to the floor. Pounding her fist into the ground, she cursed David for leaving her alone. As angry as she was that he left Liam, she was just as angry that he'd left her. Her mom had often said, the trouble with being a strong woman is that everyone assumes you can handle anything and everything. Kira never worried about everyone before everyone included David. If he thought her capable of doing this on her own, he was hugely mistaken. Taking her phone out of her back pocket, she found David's number. In case you care, Liam isn't doing well. He's slurring his speech and his right side is weak. The moment she sent it, Kira wanted to bring the text right back. Dreading his reply, she folded a towel and tucked it under her head. Can he talk at all? David texted back. Kira let out a breath. David hadn't taken her bait to argue. Yes. Tell me when he can't. Kira wanted to throw her phone. If David wouldn't come back for Liam, maybe he would come back for her. I can't do this alone. She held her breath, waiting for David's response. Laying it out there, feeling vulnerable, weren't things she did in her everyday life. She burst out a breath and glared at the screen. Nothing happened, and lacking the emotional energy to throw a proper fit and smash her phone into tiny bits, Kira gave up and went back in to be near Liam, where she fell asleep in the chair, her heart aching with the emptiness of abandonment. Waking to the doorbell, Kira bolted to the front door, waving the nurse and a maid off from answering. If this was David, and it had better be David, he was going to get a piece of her mind before he crossed the threshold. Swinging the door open, Kira planted her hand on her hip, drawing herself up for a good tongue lashing. It wasn't David, and she leaned over as if she'd been punched in the gut. Instead of David, Kira's mom stood on the doorstep, a small suitcase by her feet. Falling into Amelia's embrace, Kira asked, What are you doing here? A nice man called and said he was sending a private plane to pick me up, he said you needed me. Amelia patted her back and ran her hand down Kira's hair. After our last phone call, I could only assume it was true. Kira craned her neck to look down the driveway and saw the back of an apple-red Lamborghini growing smaller as it drove away. David, she whispered. He hadn't abandoned her, he'd gone for help. Yes, that was his name. He's such a gentleman. Amelia stepped back. Picked me up right where the plane dropped me off. Kira hung her head. He should be here. And he's not because I'm weak. Amelia put one arm around Kira and steered her into the house. He said you needed some time with your husband, but that you might need your mom too. I do. Kira hugged her once again. Feelings of gratitude that her mom was in remission warred with feelings of guilt that she couldn't do anything for Liam. Liam. The need to introduce her husband to her mother jolted through her heart. I want you to meet Liam. She pulled her through the grand entryway and into the living room. With a little prodding, Liam stirred and woke up. Kira sat on the floor next to the couch. Liam, I'd like you to meet my mother, Amelia. Liam's eyes brightened as they shook hands. Tan you for RA. You are so very welcome. Thank you for taking care of her. She's a different woman, so confident. You've obviously been good to her. Liam closed his eyes, soaking in her words. Kira took his hand between hers. Liam, do you mind if mom stays with us? Liam shook his head. She welcome. Thank you. 
Later, when Kira had a few minutes to herself, she texted David. Thank you for bringing my mother. I don't feel alone. She paused. I miss you. She added and sent before she lost her nerve. The reply came immediately. I'm not far away if you need me. She knew he wouldn't be. The household revolved around Liam's waking moments, which grew fewer and fewer as they increased his meds to cover the pain. A week in, he had a bout of nausea that took them a day or so to get under control. Kira could tell he was mortified by the messes he made, but she assured him that, as a nurse, she'd seen much worse and that it in no way changed her love for him. Late one afternoon, after combing her fingers through Liam's hair, Kira stared out the window, taking in nothing. Amelia placed a cup of juice in her hand. Drink this. Kira raised the cup, not even tasting the liquid, and drained it. Mom, I don't know what else to do for him. Honey, you're doing great. Am I? Because I feel like I'm failing. Sweetie. Amelia wrapped her up and rocked her back and forth. Kira was transported back to her childhood, where chocolate chip cookies and a hug from mom could fix all her problems. It was a feeling that Kira had lost somewhere between I.V.S and debt payments. At some point she had become the parent, and in doing so had emotionally orphaned herself. With Amelia taking back the role of mother, of comforting Kira as a child, Kira was absorbed into the family unit wholly, which allowed her to lean into her mother's hug and let it carry her pain as only a mother could. She must have felt it too, because she said, cancer took so much from me. Me too. I know. She rubbed Kira's arm as if she were trying to warm her up. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, since you've been married, I found a part of myself that I thought I'd lost, a strong part. But you needing me is good for me. I'm so sorry how that comes across. I'm not happy that you're going through this, but I'm glad to know you still need me. Mom, I always need you. I know, it's just nice to feel it. Kira gave her a sad smile, noting that David had, in his absence, given her a gift. She'd have to remember to thank him if she ever saw him again. Chapter 25 when it became obvious that Liam couldn't walk anymore, they moved a hospital bed into the front room, situating it so Liam could watch the sun filter through the trees. He'd gravitated toward that spot most days, and it seemed natural. He'd lost weight. Not wanting any life-saving measures, if he didn't eat, he didn't get nutrients. Liam lay there, shaking in his bed, one afternoon while Kira read to him. Mom, he said. Kira set her Kindle in her lap. You want me to get my mom? No. Mom. Liam waved his hand around, tears soaking the pillow. Kira got to her feet and leaned over the bed. Liam, don't cry, sweetheart. Kira dried his tears with a tissue. Mom, he croaked. Kira searched his pleading gaze. Do you want your mom? Liam calmed, and Kira had her answer. Taking her phone into the office, she slid the door shut. This would be her first conversation with David since he left. She'd sent a few more updates, but hadn't been willing to establish verbal communication. She had questions she wanted to ask, questions that text messages just wouldn't cover. For Liam, she could do anything. Dialing David's number, she steeled herself against the flood of emotions his voice would unleash. Kira, he answered in the middle of the first ring. Hi. She pressed her palm over her mouth, grateful she'd been able to get that one word out. Is he? No. He's asking for your mother. This time, she lost it. Tears fell, her throat clogged with emotion, and she blubbered, I don't know how to reach her, but she needs to come. How long does he have? There's no way to tell. 
It could be a couple days or a week. David, please. I'm so sorry you felt like you had to leave because of me. You should be here. Silence. Come, be with your brother. I can't. Not yet. Sobbing. I'll call mother. Thank you. Kira hung up and cleaned her face. David hadn't come, but he'd done what she asked, and he didn't sound angry, he sounded resigned. Knowing she could never remove the signs of tears, because they came fast and often these days, she pressed her forehead to the door and counted to ten, before going back to Liam's side. Chapter 26 The next afternoon, a woman in a matching jogging suit and shiny hair ran through the front door. Kira was in the kitchen pouring a drink and spilled orange juice all over the counter. My boy! My baby boy! The woman threw her arms over Liam and sobbed into his chest. Mom! Liam was able to lift his hands to rest them on her back. His face took on a contented glow. Kira tossed her cup in the sink, making an even bigger mess, and ran to the front door hoping to catch David before he pulled away again. Careening around the corner, she ran right into his solid chest and fell back on her bottom. Geez, are you okay? asked David as he leaned down to help her up. You're here, she gasped. I'm back. To stay? She folded her arms. To stay. The hurt and the pain and the sorrow exploded creating a chemical bomb inside Kira. You selfish son of a. She pounded her fists against his chest. You left, you left. How could you do that to Liam? To me? Hey. David grabbed her wrists. Their eyes met, and the fight fizzled out like a seventh grade science experiment. It was Liam's last wish. Kira slumped against David for support. Liam's wish? It didn't make sense. Liam loved David. He wanted a honeymoon, just you and him. He wanted to know what it felt like to have you all to himself. David looked away, his guilt showing through. Did you tell him you loved me? No. But he could see the signs. I didn't want to hurt him. Kira's forehead landed on his shoulder. You didn't. Kira, he felt, feels, nothing but love from you. Untangling herself from his arms, not even aware that they had encircled her, Kira admonished, let's make sure it stays that way. I think it would be smart to have either one of us or both of us with Liam at all times. That way he never has to worry about us being alone without him. I think that's a good idea. She turned to leave, and David snagged her hand. My feelings haven't changed, Kira. I know. And I'm eternally grateful. She texted some pretty awful things, and thought some worse ones, but David had remained true. Try as she might, she couldn't keep the love from blooming in her heart. Kira motioned towards the front room. Perhaps you should be with him and your mom for now. I'll check in soon. I'm sorry you've had to do this alone. Kira shrugged. Knowing it was Liam's wish, she'd forgiven David 100%. She couldn't blame Liam. She just. Couldn't. You're here now, that's what matters. I won't leave you again. I know that too. Kira walked away then, overwhelmed with the implications of his promise, because she knew he wasn't talking about the time between now and when Liam passed on. He was talking about forever, and it was a wonderful promise. Chapter 27 Obituary Liam Tucker Bernhard passed away in his sleep on a spring day surrounded by family. He was preceded in death by his father, William Boyd Bernhard, and is survived by his wife, Kira Bernhard, brother, David Bernhard, and his mother, Nancy Bernhard. 
There will be a private viewing for family and friends Thursday night at 7. Funeral services will be held Saturday morning at 10. Chapter 28 Kira stood next to Liam's casket wearing a black dress that brushed her knees and low flats. Trish from BMB had arrived yesterday with a garment bag and a hug. Kira hadn't thought about what she'd wear to the funeral and was grateful Trish filled the gap. The past week had moved with excruciating speed and unbearable slowness as they planned the services, had Liam moved to Boston, where he would be buried in the family tomb, and grieved. Strangers offered condolences. People who had known Liam his whole life used handkerchiefs and offered sympathy while Kira moved like a doll who had blank eyes and an empty head. She heard the buzz coursing through the family, friends, and associates over their whirlwind romance. She also heard the term gold digger tossed out like a bone in front of a mutt. Refusing to bite, Kira hung close to Liam while David hung close to her. David and his mom's constant support and obvious acceptance put a damper on some of the gossip. Nancy Bernhard, as it turned out, was a kind and gracious woman who loved her family fiercely. Because of her honest love and care for Liam, Kira had been welcomed, and heaven helped the person who tried to divide asunder Nancy's family. Kira didn't care what they thought of her but she was upset that they would think Liam stupid enough to marry someone after his money or unworthy of a lasting love. She was offended on his behalf, maybe more so because she knew he would have forgiven them with ease. Nancy had asked her to say a few words during the service, and Kira reluctantly climbed the stairs to the podium. She wished she'd said no even as she was grateful for the chance to share the Liam she loved. Twisting the white handkerchief Trish had forced into her hand, Kira began. Liam often said that life was too short. She stared at a long, skinny grain in the wood that suddenly swelled to trace a knot. Life was too short to hold a grudge. Life was too short to pass up a gelato. Life was too short for fear. For Liam, life was just too short not to make someone happy. I guess when you believe you're not going to live long, you want to live your best. It's not a lesson many people can grasp. I sure didn't, not until he taught me how. As a nurse, I've sat with several terminal patients and listened to their regrets. Do you know what they said? They said they were sorry they didn't call their parents more or that they missed going to their granddaughter's softball game. They're sorry they weren't a good friend. I think if Liam were here today, he would say that life is too short for sorrow, grudges, and petty words. Liam would tell us to dance and eat gelato and love. Kira's eyes lifted to find David. Love is sometimes the scariest chance to take, and yet, it's what life is all about. I think that what Liam taught me most was that life, God, the world, the universe, it's all about love. The giving and taking. The hoping and losing. The grasping and the letting go. Love is the blessed burden we bring into this life and the gift we take with us. I pray we can all love as Liam did, with cheerful abandon. She returned to her chair and sat between Amelia and Nancy. David put his arm behind his mom and rested his hand on Kira's shoulder. He was still there. He would always be there, loving her in his way. Despite her words, Kira wondered if she would ever be whole enough to love David back. Chapter 29 Kira stared out Liam's window. All signs of cancer had been swept from the house by Ella and the hospice group. Liam's bed was gone, donated to the organization that made him comfortable in his last days along with a couple million dollars. The television was still there, though the screen was as black as the cloud of grief that enveloped the household at Liam's passing. Everything is ready. Ella spoke softly. No one had talked above a whisper for weeks. The cavernous cabin had been a tomb of sorrow. Nancy didn't accompany Kira and David back, saying she couldn't face the memories, but Kira had to return. This was the last place Liam had been, and his spirit lingered here along with the smell of his body wash. 
The building was their home. Thank you, Ella, for all you've done. I'm going to miss you. Thank you. This job has changed me. Ella picked up a picture of Liam and Kira on their wedding day. Several photos dotted the home, one of Ella's many touches. Do you mind? She hugged the frame close. Kira had an identical image on her nightstand. Of course. Kira stared at her reflection in the glass, willing it to give Ella a hug and say, Goodbye. But her reflection didn't move, and Ella slipped into the hall and to the front door, which she opened just as the bell rang. I'm here for Kira Bernhard and David Bernhard. Kira knew it was Pamela, recognized her voice, but she had a hard time caring. Her mother assured her that at some point her ability to feel would return. From Kira's standpoint, that was unlikely to happen. It was impossible for a woman's heart to stay intact when her soulmate carried part of it to the next life. There you are. Pamela's reflection joined Kira's in the window, and David soon followed. Pamela, welcome. David shook Pamela's hand. I apologize for the state of the house, we're going through a tough time. I understand. Pamela pulled an iPad out of her bag. I hate to interrupt your family time, her eyes jumped from Kira to David. But I made a promise to Liam and I'm here to make good on that promise. Kira turned around. Would you like to sit? Pamela motioned to the couch. David took one end and Kira took the other. Neither one was willing to leave the home but they perfected the ability to live together while maintaining a three-foot bubble between them. Pamela sat between them and motioned them closer. You'll need to see the screen. They scooted in as Pamela set the pad on the coffee table, using the case to prop it up. A few swipes later, Liam's face filled the frame. Kira's hand went to her mouth, and she bit her cheek. The picture hanging in the guest bathroom was behind him, and he was healthy and handsome, and her chest burned. Excuse me a moment. Pamela stood, pressed play, and then stepped to the side, giving Kira and David the best view. Liam cleared his throat. I'm about to do something selfish and I hope you too can forgive me. Kira, I love you with the power of a thousand years. Our souls are connected in a way I never imagined possible and finding you all on this earth is a miracle. I love you, and I know you love me. What we have is beyond this world, but it was not made for this world. Will we be together again someday? Maybe. I'll be hoping for it. Pressure mounted behind Kira's eyes and teeth as she fought for control. He always knew exactly what to say. David, you are the best big brother I could have ever hoped for. Your loyalty knows no bounds, and I see how you are pulled between your love for me and your love for Kira. I'm sorry for that, but I'm not going to give her up. Not yet. Kira, I'm asking David to leave for a while so I can be with you. I want this time alone with my wife. Please forgive me for this one selfish act. You have my blessing, when I'm gone, to be together if you choose. Kira, you once asked me what my masterpiece in this life would be. I didn't know it at the time, but I've come to realize that you and David could have a masterpiece of a life. Together. I won't haunt you, I promise. Although, if you wanted to name your firstborn son after me, I think that would be appropriate. Kira laughed through her tears. I love you both, and above all else, I pray for your happiness. Kira stared up at Pamela. When did he send this? Weeks ago. She hugged her stomach. Liam was amazing. His love and concern for Kira reached beyond the grave. He thought sending David away was selfish, but he'd given Kira more love than she'd ever known in such a short amount of time. He'd shown her that she was stronger than she ever thought and capable of loving on a level that traversed time and space. Pamela moved the iPad and sat on the coffee table, 
facing Kira. I have made hundreds of matches in my time, and I've had three mismatches. Kira lifted the corners of her mouth with great effort. And I thought I was a singularity. No, my dear. I don't understand why it happened, and I'm so sorry. But I need you to know this was not a mismatch. Liam was not a mistake. I know that, Pamela. That's what makes this so hard. Pamela took Kira's and David's hands. This is not a mismatch either. Placing David's hand on top of Kira's sent warmth up her arm. Focusing on the awakening of her soul, Kira flipped her hand over and clutched David's fingers. An earnestness filled his being. I could never ask you to stop loving Liam, that would be like asking me to stop loving him, and that isn't gonna happen. But is it possible that you could love me too? Pamela, the couch, the room, the world melted away, and Kira stared into David's indigo eyes, the eyes of a man she had grown to love and respect. That love sputtered to life, bursting through Kira's heart. Pushing his hand away, she fell into his open arms. David stroked her hair, his embrace as sure and strong as she needed. He held her tight. We've unfinished business, Bugatti. We do? She gripped his shirt, unwilling to let him go just yet. We do. Can we go together? Always. Chapter 30 Kira, her arm looped through David's, strolled along the streets of Rome, a chocolate gelato in her free hand. How's your pistachio? Not bad. But it's not vanilla? I heard that the first vanilla bean grew in the Garden of Eden, and when Eve was cast out for eating the apple, she took it with her. You made that up. Kira swatted him. But it sounds right. David grinned. They exited the small street, and the Fontana de Trevi spread before them. It's busy today, busier than the last time we were here. The zip and zing felt right, the energy of a dozen tourists following their guide, the young mothers spoon-feeding their babies in strollers, and the teenage boys watching the women with guarded interest. Life played out around the fountain, good lives and not-so-great lives, but life. David pulled three coins out of his pocket. You know the legend? If you toss a coin over your shoulder and into the fountain, then you're destined to return one day. Yes. This one is for you. He placed it face up in her open palm. This one is for me. He tucked it into his hand. And this one is for Liam. He held it up between his thumb and his finger. It's perfect. Kira kissed Liam's coin. Kira threw hers in first, twisting her tongue just in case the coin needed a boost to create magic. David flipped his with his thumb, and it twisted and twirled, bouncing light before plopping into the water. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they held Liam's coin between them and tossed it over their heads. Having accomplished what they flew around the world to do, they sat on the edge of the fountain to finish their gelatos. Kira's phone beeped Skype. She hurried to answer in case it was either of their moms. Hello? Pamela's face popped up. Kira, you're looking beautiful today. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you for the flowers. They were stunning. Is that the Trevi fountain behind you? Kira smiled. Trust Pamela to recognize the historic landmark from a Skype image. Yes. Well, I guess I can't talk you into coming into the office today. What's up? I received a notice that Liam had changed his will and made you his sole beneficiary. Kira glanced at David, who lifted one shoulder. He did what? I didn't think he could do that with the prenup. The will is very specific and overrides our agreement. I, I don't. She shoved David's shoulder. Did you know about this? She asked. No, David shook his head but he was smiling. That's so Liam. 
you've been given his share of the family trust and multiple properties, including one in Italy you might want to check out while you're there. I think I've already seen it. When you get back to the States, come see me and Harrison, and we'll get this figured out. Okay? Okay. Bye. Now. Kira tucked her phone in her back pocket. Shaking her head, she said, I wish I could hug him right now. And then punch him in the arm. He didn't have to do that. David took both their cones and threw them over his shoulder and into the fountain. David. Kira glanced around, frantically looking for the man with the net. She did not want an all-expense-paid tour of an Italian prison. David took both her hands in both of his. Kira, the trust is two halves of one whole. You and I are legally bound together. His words were laced with preamble. David? I love you, Kira. Kira thought of how she'd beg the Lord for more time with Liam, who believed their love spanned eternity. Kira believed him. But this earth, this life, was meant for a different kind of love. The kind she shared with David. Being here with the families, bright summer sunshine, and hope was an awakening of a different sort. I love you, too. David scooped Kira into his arms and crushed her lips with his. Surprised, Kira took a moment to respond, but once she did, she gave the kiss her all. Kissing David was like nothing she'd experienced before. His loyalty, his kindness, and his decency were tangled with a passion that had her quaking. David, she sighed against his lips. Marry me. David kissed her cheek, and then the soft spot behind her ear. Cupping her face in both hands, he pressed his lips to her forehead. Is it too soon? Kira asked, her mind heady with the feeling of being wanted and adored. We'll live in Gaeta for a while. He kissed her with passion and fervor. We'll call Ella, and she'll have the whole thing arranged in two days. Kira laughed. Ella quit. She retired. We'll just have to pull her out of retirement for a week. I must be crazy to consider this. Running his hands down her arms, David brought her fingers to his lips, kissing each one in turn. Life is too short to live without you. Kira pressed her palm to his cheek. She stared into his love-filled eyes and heard Liam chuckle. He would not want them to be sad and low on his behalf. He'd want them to feel all there was to feel, to taste all the sweet and sour moments in life, and to stop to smell the roses, the ocean and the pasta al dente. Marry me today, now, David. Let's find a church and a priest, and let's get married. What about a dress and a cake, Anne? She pressed her finger over his lips. It's not about all that, it's about love. Yes, it is. David kissed her again. As they ran down the narrow streets, dodging scooters and holding hands, Kira couldn't help but think of the last time they ran through the streets of Rome. She'd been running away from so many things, but this time, she ran towards them. The fear of never being enough for a man that had followed her into her marriage to Liam was gone, because where there was love, fear could not abide. And, with David, there would always be love. You've been listening to The Resilient Bride, a billionaire marriage broker's romance novel. Written by Lucy McConnell. Read by Christina Dimmick. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the book. I hope it brought you peace. I hope it brought peace into your life because um, that was the reason that I wrote it. And honestly, after it was published, I received so many absolutely beautiful emails from readers who were excited to share their stories of survival, who wanted to share their stories of grief and who were just thankful that they had a place that they could go and read this story about something that they had gone through, um, either themselves or with somebody they loved. And so I invite you to leave comments. Um, let's keep it all kind. I'm wearing my, I don't know if you can see it, be kind shirt today. Let's keep it kind in the comments there. 
And, um, but yes, please feel free to share, like the video, subscribe, do all of those things to help other people find this channel and this book. And thank you. Please remember that you are deeply loved and I will see you in the next audio book.